and I'm the Vice President of the Midwest and Texas regions representing our member services team and I'm going to be your MC for the day today and uh, for the program highlighting consumer engagement. We'll be hearing from some really incredible marketers across the industry from Ibotta, Marriott International, American Express, Mondelez International, and also KFC. Please be sure to ask questions and use the chat function to engage with both our speakers and other attendees during the, during the presentation and the event. Before we kick off with today's live cast, we'd like to share a short video that highlights our recent Media Buying Summit event and all the incredible marketers that we featured there. We are thrilled to have you joining us for our latest and greatest marquee event, the Brand Innovators 2021 Media Buying Summit. Welcome everyone, uh, let's get started. Thank you for having me. I'm so excited about this show. All right, so I'm back. I have, I have two dogs too, so they might wanna join the party <laughs> later. <laughs> We have a truly fantastic program planned for you with what I would say is an epic group of speakers, senior media buyers and marketing leadership from some of the world's biggest brands. We looked at media more holistically than ever. Consumers don't necessarily know the difference between a paid side of the house versus an influencer, creative versus organic. To them, it all looks like your brand, it's your advertising. It's another thing when you have a brand that's 50 years old that people think of as a brick and mortar retailer, and you've got to figure out how you're going to tell a story to get them to rethink and create a, a moment of reconsideration for your brand. So again, how do we use data? We looked at regionally, where do we have inventory? Because for a while, we stopped making cars and we started making ventilators and masks. First of all, there was a lot of people who really wanted cars because it's your own personal space. Spending really went way back up. And so like at the end of the year, we were back at like our normal budget levels and um, launching the Escalade. What we decided that we were going to define uh, content commerce as shortening the distance between inspiration and purchase. It does away with that kind of multi-step, lengthier sequence of product, product searching, researching. And I think what's really interesting about this space is that these kind of micro moments of discovery are happening more and more in your social feed and, and through short form video that you're interacting with. It's just, there's just too much now, too much clutter. And we've gone from 30 second ads to now 15 second ads and six second ads. So I, I feel like that is an opportunity for us to reset the balance here. And I feel like that's a huge opportunity and to create, a, I think, a much better ad experience. I will always recommend that you wanna have the people who work on your business to be as close to dedicated on your business as you possibly can. If you know that they're working for you, then their priorities aren't split. Being on the streets, connecting with our consumers is critical. So we have a division structure that enables and empowers our local teams to make decisions based on what is right for their market. Like many other brands, we just had to adapt to make sure that we're meeting customer needs, um, as well as they're changing media consumption habits, right? So fortunately for us uh, last year, our various creative agencies and, and media agencies uh, and partners were just very accommodating as we were trying to navigate those challenges. I think 2021 will be a very interesting year as we all kind of learn and understand uh, the new dynamics at play and how they impact all of our respective businesses. Wow, some really great marketers and great learnings from that summit. Perfect timing as well, as I'm sure many of you are already into your 2022 planning or starting soon. So without further ado, let's kick off our program for today and welcome our first speakers of the day. Please welcome Erica Rutledge, Associate Marketing Manager of Growth Retention at Ibotta, and also Majith Nukon, Customer Engagement Evangelist at Braze. We look forward to hearing from you. Hi, Erica. Hi, how are you? Good, thanks for joining us. Hi, Erica, hi. How are you? Good, hi, Andrea. Hi, Erica. Hello, well, welcome to our stage and, for, and thank you so much for kicking off the day for us to talk about consumer engagement. I am gonna let, um, let you guys take it away. Yeah, absolutely, thank you. And thank you for that wonderful video. I loved it, by the way. 
Awesome. Very good. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the session on the Brace 2021 Customer Engagement Review session. My name is Majid Nuhukan. I'm the evangelist at Brace. Brace is a customer engagement platform, and our vision is to forge human connection between consumers and the brands they love through relevant and memorable customer experiences. And I'm super excited that I'm joined today by Erika Radlich from iBota. We have you know, invited Erika here today because um, Erika is a great marketer who have made a huge impact at iBota using customer engagement. And we knew Erica would have a lot to share with all of you today and their story of success from iBota. So welcome to the show, Erica. And before I hand it over to Erica in a few minutes, let's jump directly into the research that we have published here at Brace. So in February, Brace released our 2021 Global Customer Engagement Review. And we decided to do this research because after years of brands rapidly rethinking about digital experiences because of the pandemic, you know, we wanted to give a deeper understanding and defining of what success looks like in this space and identifying ways for marketers uh, can improve their result, right? So it's the first of its kind. And we contacted this decision maker survey by interviewing more than 1,300 VP plus across 10 global markets uh, with an annual revenue of 10 million plus uh, US dollars from their company. And of course, we have used tapped into our customer base as well uh, to uncover tactics that drive up important metrics like you know, LTV and retention and also uh, purchases. And with that, the first goal of our research was to gauge where brands are at and what they are planning for this specific year 2021. And as everyone um, knows on this call, the COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized the importance of digital first and also digital only customer experiences. And 60% of the marketing decision makers said that their budget will increase in the next 12 months. So in this case, 2021 up until February of next year. So no surprise that the top three areas brands are looking to invest uh, in our customer satisfaction measurements. Number one, customer engagement, and third would be mobile optimization and apps. And the second goal for our research was to uncover what the challenges are. And when we heard overwhelmingly that uh, it's connecting campaign results to an actual revenue and business impact, even as brands experiences considerable momentum in customer engagement and express a lot of confidence about it, the thread is breaking when it actually comes to demonstrating success and brands are losing momentum because of it. So while 88% of marketing leaders believe that their teams have excellent or good customer engagement practices, 70% 4% of them still worry that their metrics don't translate into a tangible business outcome. So one of the main factors contributing to this problem is that teams within a given organization don't always agree on what success looks like. So, and as you see here on the screen, only 26% of the marketing leaders say that their firms have shared a company-wide definition of success when it comes to customer engagement. So the idea of having clear objectives shared across the teams um, is just one area where brands are either struggling or doing well. And we wanted to dig into the other competencies that seem to fuel great customer experiences. So with that, as you see here on the screen, we thought you know, the best way to do that would be to design a maturity framework based on the questions that we asked all those 1,300 BP plus in marketing and uncover 12 different areas of competencies that we think we think are important for customer engagement. So on the technology axis, as you see here, we asked about, for example, um, customer engagement channels their companies use, how they segment and classify customers, how sophisticated their use of data is, and then went on to ask about orchestration performance and also the personalization side of things. And on the team axis, we asked about the respondents' company cultures, whether if they regularly test and learn and how success is being measured and defined, and generally also about the ownership of uh, uh, customer engagement 
market at their companies. And from there, we found three clear levels of maturity. Number one, activate brands. These are uh, companies just beginning to recognize customer engagement as important to their business goals. And number two would be accelerate brands collaborating across cross departments, but they are still very campaign oriented and they may not have a complete view of customers across platforms and channels. And finally, the ACE brands, these are the top performing brands in the index. And that's um, that's what we are gonna talk about today with Ibota um, here. And through our decision maker survey um, and aggregated brace customer data, we found that being an ACE has a direct revenue impact, right? So when ACE brands commit to a deeper level of personalization or even use a cross-channel approach or when they collaborate more, when they test more, they have a common shared understanding of success. And the impact, as you see here on the screen, speaks for itself. So ACE brands drive a high number of buyers who are making more purchases and who spend more with each purchase. And this is what the customer engagement review all about. And this is how we have bucketed brands into activate, accelerate, and ACE brands. And now to talk more about how ACE brands defines customer success, uh, customer engagement and their success, I'm going to hand it over to you, Erika. Take it away. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so as was mentioned, my name is Erica Rutledge. I am an associate marketing manager on the lifecycle marketing team at Ibotta. And now for those of you unfamiliar with Ibotto, we provide cashback offers in store and online through our app. And as of last year, our browser extension on web. The core of our business focuses on cashback for grocery offers, but we also offer cashback for gift card purchases, e-commerce transactions, and more. I've been with Ibotta for about two and a half years now. I focus on the retention and engagement efforts for our existing users. More specifically, I focus on driving incremental grocery offer redemptions through monetary incentives such as bonuses, uh, where a user, user will get money added to their account if they redeem a certain number of offers during the time frame of bonuses live and other incentives. My team also focuses on activation of new users, reactivation of dormant users, and crossover to other areas of the business like online shopping and our browser extension. So in the next two slides, I'm gonna to speak to some key learnings across the user life cycle and highlight one of our most powerful programs that we launched last November for Thanksgiving. So as I mentioned, I look for opportunities to engage active users, but also to prevent users from going dormant. We do this by maximizing use of our data to deliver value back to our users. Through this, we have four major takeaways that fall under the tech and team customer engagement strategies previously mentioned. So when it comes to having the right tech, Ibotta utilizes all of our active channels because we see the highest engagement rates and the best ROI when we do. Such channels include email, push, in-app messages, SMS, and webhooks. And we're also looking to launch new channels such as webpush since we launched our browser extension last year and we wanna meet the user where they're shopping. We have also seen personalization drive engagement. One way we use personal data in this way is by celebrating milestone moments, like when a saver earns their first $20. This is such an important moment in a user's life cycle for us because it creates this, this dopamine moment, a level of excitement after earning a substantial amount of money with Ibotta. And because we don't wanna miss this important moment, we celebrate with them by sending communications through all of our channels to highlight it and so they don't lose momentum, which in turn leads to higher open rates, uh, higher click-through rates and more redeemed offers, which is exactly what we wanna see. Team structure and collaboration are crucial to our success as well. The team at Ibotta has grown exponentially over the last few years. And as such, we have reevaluated our team structure to ensure team alignment and make collaboration easier. Previously, my team focused on retention of existing users and another team focused on activation of new users. While we did meet often to collaborate, there was opportunity for us to improve the user lifecycle together. So our teams were combined into one to provide that improved alignment internally for our team, as well as externally for our users who receive different programming depending on where they're at in their life cycle. So essentially we wanted to make that handoff a bit smoother. Beyond team collaboration on life cycle though, we also work cross-functionally with product, engineering, analytics, creative, 
and other teams across the business on a regular basis to ensure a cohesive experience, to test new ideas and ultimately drive more redemptions. One example of this is when we worked with our analytics team uh, to add holdouts to our SMS channel so we could understand its impact and best way to utilize it. We learned that it should be used for high impact messages because the audience tends to be some of our most highly engaged users and as such will be the most receptive to new products and tests we're running. Without this test, we could have seen higher opt-out rates or other negative impacts because we weren't utilizing the channel in the right way, which is why you should always be testing, testing your communications, testing your channels and testing any programs you're running. Don't assume anything. And even if you achieve positive results, retest to optimize those results because they can always be improved. So you might be asking yourself for an example of how we apply these learnings. On the next slide, I'll speak to our free Thanksgiving program to provide that information. So last year, we launched our novel free Thanksgiving program where we partnered with Walmart and other major brands to provide 100% cash back on Thanksgiving groceries. It required collaboration across the entire company and with external brands, but our team structure helped set us up for success to deliver a personalized omni-channel experience that allowed us to drive multiple initiatives at once. Such initiatives include user acquisition, increased referrals, product adoption, crossover to grocery pickup and delivery category, re-engagement of inactive users, deepen customer advocacy and brand awareness, a lot of different initiatives. So to accomplish these, we segmented users based on data like registration date, redemption frequency, and more to provide different paths for those users, each with its own goal in mind. For example, we broke active users out into two sub-segments, those who had downloaded our new browser extension and those who had not. Our goal for those who had the extension downloaded was to engage and retain them. Whereas the goal for those who had not downloaded the extension was to drive crossover to that new product. Because of this segmentation, we're able to successfully launch our new product, taking us to hundreds of thousands of new users on web, as well as see an increase in retention rates. So as you can see, using personal data to drive engagement strategies can accomplish more than just one goal if you segment properly. Now, in addition to using segmentation, our communications played a major role in the success of the program. We supported it through all channels, um, launching over 50 triggered communications, and we saw pretty awesome results with an average 66% open rate, which is much higher than the industry standard and even our own company standard. In this slide, you can actually see some examples of what our cross-channel communications looked like. And although these communications were handled by different teams, you can see that visually they all feel and look the same and they mirror the product experience as well. This again speaks to the high level of collaboration and team structure that led us to success. Now, one other accomplishment I would be remiss not to mention is that because of the free Thanksgiving program, we fed 3 million Americans, which equates to about 1% of the population. This is such a humbling stat, given how hard of a year 2020 was for many. Plus, a lot of our savers actually donated the food, so those more in need could benefit from it, which is always great to see. And honestly, it's these moments that are a big reason why I love my job. There's nothing more satisfying than doing work that pos positively impacts the lives of so many people. And while I do love doing work that improves people's lives, it's also important that your work positively impacts the business, which I will speak to more in my next slide. So I've already spoken to some of the incredible results that came from the Thanksgiving program, but there are a few more that I want to highlight, including activation, monetization, and retention. As you can see, we drove activation with over 1 million new users and a 5x increase in referral month over month. This was a huge increase from any other month during 2020 and shows how strong the user acquisition and PR team's plans were in bringing in new users from TV ads to referral programming and more. We also sought to monetize specific areas of the business like grocery pickup and delivery because it was a new category we want launched last year in response to the shifting shopping behaviors moving online during COVID. 
To do this, we set up trigger communications promoting pickup or delivery, as well as including it in the primary messaging and the hierarchy of the communications plan. Because of these efforts, we increased the online gross reductions by over 200%, seeing adoption of a new feature we had put so much time and effort into launching earlier that year. So really great to see that pay off. And finally, when it came to retention, we hope this program would reactivate users who had gone dormant by providing a high value hook. And then once we hooked them and activated them, easing them back into earning cash back with Ibotta by creating programming specifically for them. Through this, we were able to reactivate 250,000 users who had previously been dormant. Plus, when we asked our savers how the free Thanksgiving program made them feel about Ibotta, 76% said the campaign makes them proud to be a user, and 86% said the campaign made them want to use Ibotta more. So we were able to drive that customer loyalty, which plays a huge part in the lifetime value of a user. Overall, the program was a win for everyone. It was a win for our business. It was a win for our clients, and it was a win for our users. And of course, we learned a lot from it, and we'll apply those learnings to future programming. And then on the final slide, really just summarizes um, what we've been talking about. So this is the ACE factor when it comes to Ibotta. This is where we excel at. So as I mentioned with tech, we use data to drive a lot of our decision and programming, and then to segment those users um, down different paths to drive multiple initiatives at once. Um, that was seen in the free Thanksgiving program, and we had a lot of positive results from that. And then, as I said with Teams, we actually recently restructured, as I mentioned before, um, I think that's always good with such a, with our company growing at such a fast pace, um, I think it's always good to reevaluate to make sure you're set up for success, um, giving those changes to, to the environment. So, we are already are a very collaborative environment. Um, I work with stakeholders across the business, always keeping a bird's eye view of what's going on, how they're, what they're doing impacts me and vice versa, what I'm doing, how it impacts them. Um, and then always experimenting. You know, the, one of our values is a good idea can come from anywhere. So always wanna experiment, test new ideas um, and push the limits of, of how you can improve them. And that's it for me. Awesome. Um, thank you, Erica. Absolutely loved it. Absolutely loved all the insights. So for those, uh, those of you interested in the customer engagement review, if you want to dive deeper, please visit Bryce.com slash CER. With that, um, Erica, I enjoyed the Thanksgiving uh, campaign that you have done. And then you said, you know, this is what makes your job meaningful. I can absolutely agree with you on that. So amazing um, campaign, amazing results. So how about we spend the next few minutes uh, diving a little deeper uh, into Fireside Chat? I do have a few questions. How does that yeah, sound? Yeah, let's do it. Awesome, very good. So um, we talked about you know, uh, staffing and team structure. So I'm going to start uh, with that. The first question is, if you could tell the audience today, how is your team organized and how does that structure help you achieve your goals, number one? And number two, how does it help you in your day-to-day -day work, Erica? Sure. So uh, having cross-functional support definitely helps us test and learn quickly. The lifecycle team is organized by lifecycle stage. So some of us focus on retention of existing users, while others focus on the activation of new and dormant users. And I mentioned this earlier, but there's a, a recent change to our team structure. Uh, so that way we could improve that alignment across teams on what that handoff looks like so it doesn't feel disjointed. And we also work with partners across the business, analytics, product engineering, more. And we meet with those teams on a regular basis. Always want to keep those lines of communication open. Um, we set up these regular meetings with them and stay abreast of their team initiatives, understand how our tests, like I said, impact their, their um, areas of focus. Um, and plus getting more perspectives is always beneficial for innovation because it's easy to get siloed in your own work instead of thinking how what you're doing impacts the larger company goals. So I think just making sure that you're always um, meeting with people, even if it might not seem that what they're doing will directly impact you, you can always get, get new ideas um, and get great collaboration that way. 
Yeah, absolutely. Erica, you mentioned a few times life cycle uh, uh, teams, right? So I want to ask you if you could talk a little bit about the actual structure of each of the life cycle team. How many developers or product managers do you work with, let's say, on the retention team? And when you look at the customer acquisition team, would it be the same or would that be different? Yeah, so there are three of us that focus on retention. Um, and then three that focus on uh, new users and dormant users. We kind of have it split in half uh, and focus for the life cycle team. Uh, so me and my direct report specifically focus on uh, increasing grocery offer redemptions while um, our counterpart who focuses on retention as well, she all, her area of focus is on crossover to other uh, lines of business and crossing users over into them. So like I said, our browser extension into different categories um, like grocery pickup delivery, online shopping. And then our activation team also has three people and that's broken out by um, those areas of focus of activation of new users and then reactivation of dormant users. So they split it up a little bit differently than us, um, but that is what we have found like works well for us, but we're also going through a transition right now. We're reevaluating on seeing if that's the, um, the best setup for our team, but so far it's worked really well. Amazing. And um, let's move into the classification side of business now. And before I ask you the question, I want to remind everyone now, uh, please use the question functionality in Zoom or chat functionality to ask us questions. We would pick it up right after this fire set chat. So question to you, uh, Erica, how did you segment the iBota user base for the free Thanksgiving dinner that you talked about? And generally, how do you approach segmentation and classification? Yeah, that's a great question. So we segmented users uh, using webhooks based on a variety of criteria, such as registration dates um, and others. And then depending on which segment they fell into, the free offers could have been available immediately upon launch of the program, or we could have required you to take an action to unlock them. So create a little friction there. Um, and that was aiming to drive different goals, like I said, of product adoption, et cetera. Uh, generally, before segmenting users, though, we like to think of the end goal and, and how to best segment users to achieve that goal. So by breaking up new users, existing users, and dormant users, for example, allows us to draw concrete lines between teams and the programming we run, and then also create different paths for those users as well, because they're going to need very different experiences to um, engage them and then retain them long term. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Erica, we live in a world today where your consumers have the opportunity to interact with multiple devices and multiple channels, right? Let that be smartphones, smartwatches, tablets, PCs, and the list has been growing on one side. And on the other side, if you look at the channels, email, SMS, web push notifications, mobile push, in-app, the list has been keep on growing. And you mentioned okay. to, in the beginning of uh, the presentation, cross-channel, right? So how do you employ cross-channels to create brilliant connected customer experiences? Yeah, I actually think this is something that we have a lot of opportunity still to improve on because uh, up until last year, we were just a mobile only <laughs> company. So that's yeah. all we had to focus on. And then all of a sudden we launched the browser extension and it threw this whole new channel um, opportunity into the mix. So um, we've been working, like I said, to launch those new communication channels like web push and browser messages so we can meet the saver where they're using Ibotta. But also we've been updating our ongoing evergreen triggered lifecycle communications to include more personalization based on what platform a user is redeeming on. So that way we can drive crossover to different channels. And then also, you know, like what categories they're using. We're always looking to make that experience personalized while also trying to drive crossover to other lines of business. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the points that stuck with me when you were presenting, Erica, is that testing is king right? And yes. 100% agree with you on that. So I want to ask you in terms of the culture in your company, how do you develop that mindset, number one, of, you know, culture of testing and experimentation? How do you give your uh, marketers the freedom to come up with new ideas to experiment at Ibota? Yeah, ultimately, I think this comes from the top down with leadership setting that team culture. Like I said, one of our values is a good idea can come from anywhere. And I think that value drives that mindset 
um, of exp experimentation because we are encouraged and sometimes even rewarded to bring new ideas to the table and test them and see if they'll pass the litmus test. Uh, it also lies in the collaborative environment we have at Ibotta because we um, often test our best ideas from working cross-functionally with other departments to brainstorm solutions. Um, and you know, sometimes we've even held Shark Tank style competitions to, to get those different ideas. Um, so we've actually put money behind the best ones. Uh, so coming forward with you know, ideas of scope and impact level of effort, and then choosing which ones are going to be um, the most valuable and then running with them and putting money behind to test them. That's ultimately just the culture here is just always test. Um, and it's very easy to feel like stagnant with your communications. Never want to do that. Things are constantly changing. So we always try to um, retest, even if it's something we've done, like let's say a few years ago and we figured out like how we want to best use SMS. That can change. We want to retest that. Yeah, amazing. And I love the idea of using Shark Tank as a way to motivate people, right? And putting some money behind it, some sort of, you know, incentive so that you know, uh, uh, employees get motivated to come up with new ideas. Amazing. So I do have like final couple of questions. And in the meantime, I want to remind everyone uh, watching the show to use the chat functionality or Q&A to ask us questions. I do see we have quite a lot of questions coming in already. So with that, wrapping questions to number one, What's the one tip or advice that you can share with brands today that they can start implementing tomorrow, Erica? Yeah, I think this goes into what I was just saying that I think the simplest thing that brands can do is ask their employees for ideas on how to improve their product and user experience. I think, you know, employee, it doesn't matter what your what your day to day responsibilities are, or what your title is. We all uh, experience like our own businesses and products as a user as well. And so being able to come forward if you have an idea and then run with it is huge. So like I said, we do like Shark Tank style competitions. Um, it doesn't have to be that formal or intense, but just putting it out there that we want your ideas, we want to test them. Um, and then ultimately we want to want to take them to fruition, you know, make sure that they're going to work and then make them real, which to me is always cool to see if you come with an idea um, and then it has a real impact on the business. That's always very rewarding for employees. Yeah, absolutely. You should have uh, like a real impact for business. And then you also mentioned, um, you know, ideas can come from everywhere. So it's about building that mentality and mindset within the company so that, you know, people feel free to come up with new ideas, um, uh, which is beneficial for the business. And the last question to you, Erica, based on everything that we have talked about, what's next for Ibota? Yeah, we have a lot of exciting things coming. Um, actually, tomorrow... There's going to be an announcement. I can't say much about it other than we are using our learnings from the free Thanksgiving program to drive what's next. So definitely stay tuned. It's going to be super exciting. Another very impactful program, we hope. Um, and then other than that, just overall, we have a lot of great things in the work um, across the board from new product features, um, marketing efforts, like I said, making our lifecycle communications more omni-channel focused is definitely a huge goal for this next year so that we can continue to drive crossover to new products and also just have that personalization for the user, um, make sure it makes sense. And yeah, a lot of great things. Um, we just announced a partnership with Walmart. So stay tuned for that as well because we have a lot of great things coming out that way. Fantastic. Erica, I'm so excited to see what's going to come up tomorrow. Very excited. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Okay, with that, I want to open up questions to the audience. Like I said, we do have a few questions coming in. I do see a few of you commenting. It's a great presentation. Yes. And then I, I'm going to pick up one question now. I do see that we are approaching the time. Um, what kind of data did Ibota need for the free Thanksgiving dinner campaign? Yeah, so we needed historical data to create the segments um, to begin with, to send users down those different paths. But we also used real-time data to keep those various segments of users engaged beyond the free Thanksgiving offers. So as an example, if a user had redeemed all of those free offers, um, we then had triggered comms to showcase other complimentary offers 
um, that they might need for Thanksgiving. So kind of honing in on those basket adjacent offers um, cause we don't want it to just be one and done, right? Like you come in for this really big program. We want it to be beyond that big hook. How do we keep you engaged beyond that? Um, and, and like I said, for historical data, we used things like, um, whether you had sessioned or not, um, whether what like redemption frequency. So how we segment them out into, let's say like new dormant, um, and then active users, and then the active split of active with our browser extension and then active without. So we had all these various segmentations um, and then use that to, to determine whether or not they needed to take an action or not to unlock the offers. Amazing. Erica, thank you for joining us today. It's an absolute pleasure to host you um, and to talk about customer engagement. It was very insightful. Um, and to everyone who took the time to join us today for this session, I want to thank all the audience as well. Again, thank you, everyone. Thank you, Erica. Have a great day wherever you are, everyone. Thank you. Andrea, I believe you are on mute. Like when they, I figure it should like unmute me right away when I'm brought back. But so thank you guys so much. It was really great to to hear the way your companies are prioritizing both tech and teamwork in order to really get those full benefits of consumer engagement. Um, it was great to see the results of the Thanksgiving campaign and the impact personalizing the communication had on the results, major increases in open rates, and also that driving of the loyalty. That's really awesome. So best of both worlds in those results. Um, also love the idea of using Shark Tank to kind of get some ideas from employees and a way to motivate and find uh, kind of new ideas that could come up through the, through the system and from the team, really fun. So great stuff. Thank you again to you both for sharing with us today. It was uh, a really great session. Thank you so much for having us. Very much for having for us. Sure. Thank you. Great rest of your day. Thank you. Next up, audience, we're going to hear from Christine Ketmer, Senior Director of Global Enterprise Insights and Strategy for Marriott International, and Jenny Simon, Sales Director of Simon Data. I'll give them both a second to join us. We have Christine. Hi, Christine. Hi, good afternoon. Nice to be here. Hi, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Good. We're just uh, give us another second as we get Jenny um, to join us as well. How's your day going so far? It's been great. Thank you. I've been in a couple of strategy meetings this morning and now obviously doing the session at lunchtime here. So it's been yeah. a good day and it's starting good to cool day. down a little bit in DC. Still pretty muggy, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, uh, it is here too. I'm in Chicago area and we're just having like rain and mugginess. It's not fun, but we're happy to have summer. That's it. <laughs> Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. I just can't believe how fast this year is already going by when you think that we're in the middle of July. The summer is going by quickly. The year is going by quickly. Everything. So. I know, I know. And it's just great like that I think businesses are picking up too and hopefully your business is picking up as well. I know uh, obviously it's it was a challenge over, uh, you know, the last year in 2020 and, uh, you know, just kind of people are traveling. And I know myself, I've been I've been on your app really busy over the last week because I'm planning a road trip um, in a couple of weeks uh, in August. So I've been booking away and using some of my Bonvoy points. And oh, uh, <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I mean, as you said, I think there I always talk about like the revenge travel or the double down travel that people are spending a little bit more, but they're excited about it. But then that enthusiasm is also tied back to just the planning as much as it is the experience. So yeah, we're really happy that people are out and about again, which is wonderful. So great. It sounds like I'm going to have a little bit of technical difficulty with Jenny here, so she'll be back on in a second. But um, yeah, I, uh, I know that personally, we're also traveling again um, for business um, and personal. So it's, uh, I actually have a trip next week. I have, um, I got to go to Dallas and then I've got to, I'm in Chicago, so I'm just driving to Michigan, but still I have to, it's travel. Exactly. <laughs> I'm still moving someplace. I'm going. <laughs> That's what counts, right? Exactly. Gets you back yeah. out there and personally, professionally, everything, which is wonderful. Yeah, exactly. Here we go. Here comes Jenny here. Just, up. Just give her another second. Welcome. Hi, Jenny. How are you? Good. How are you guys? I'm Good. sorry, I'm having a, a bit of a technical problem with my background, so I'm just going to blur Don't my background. It. That's okay. <laughs> That's okay. Don't worry about it. I still got our 10th anniversary on the background, celebrating you know all year long for that. So thank you guys so much. Um, 
welcome to you both. Uh, we're going to hear, I'm just going to kind of repeat here uh, for the audience. We have Christine Kettmer, Senior Director of Global Enterprise Insights and Strategy for Marriott International, and Jenny Simon, Sales Director for Simon Data. Welcome to you both. I'll let you Thanks. guys take it away for the discussion today. Excited to hear from you. Yeah. So thank you so much for hosting us. And Christine, hi, nice to see you again. You too, Jenny. Thank you. I know they just announced us, but uh, so I wanted just to start and dig, uh, dig right in. Um, first of all, I've been a fan of Marriott for a very, very long time. I can remember my first business trip back in 1999 when I first experienced Marriott Brands. So it, it's been a wonderful experience. I'm a brand supporter over the last two decades. Uh, Really a lot has changed, but I'm still very loyal to the brand and I love the app. I'm planning my first business trip post pandemic. I'm super excited about it. And uh, I just wanna let you know, I hopped on the Bonvoy app and saw some changes. It's really fantastic. I love to hear that. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks for the loyalty. And yeah, we're just, we were just talking about how enthusiastic we are that people are starting to travel again and feel excited about their future trips and everything too. Awesome. So. Let's start by uh, you telling us a little bit about your history with Marriott. I know you've been there for seven and a half years, and I'd love to hear what gets you excited about still working there. Sure, happy to. So as you said, I've been with the company, I've been with Marriott International, which is our corporate headquarters for about seven and a half years now in different roles and capacities. So I started off on a team really focused on consumer insights, and then it evolved into customer experience. I then had a stint in global brand management where I was in charge of the JW Marriott global brand team. So amazing experience helping to open several of our hotels, doing workshops with teams all around the world as we were thinking about our branding, our strategy, positioning. And then most recently, in the past um, little less than a year, I've been on this new team. It's called Global Enterprise Insights and Strategy. And what our team really does is look at like macroeconomic trends. So we focus on what are the things that are most important to our guests? Where do we see some of the white spaces and opportunity areas? How are these driving different guest satisfaction experiences? Like really just looking very holistically as well as helping with like just again, that consumer insights piece, thinking about how we activate and make sure that we're helping from a strategic planning perspective, supporting our leaders as we're thinking short, long-term, where do we head next as well? Awesome. Thank you. Um, Marriott, I read, has been a, a, an entity or a brand since 1927. And I understand you guys started out as a very interesting nine stool root beer stand. Uh, a lot has changed during that time. I'd be interested to know what your strategy was coming into the pandemic and how that's changed with the pandemic over the last year. Sure. Yeah. So as you said, I mean, it's kind of funny because Marriott has an interesting story. I mean, I think a lot of times people think of us, obviously, for our hotels and resorts and locations all around the world. But we are a hospitality company. We started, as you said, like as this nine seat root beer stand, like a couple miles away in Washington, D.C. here. And, um, you know, I think some of the core values have always been there in terms of what we were thinking both before the pandemic and certainly even more so now. But a lot of it has to do with this idea of putting people first. So so putting our associates out there and taking care of them so that they take care of our guests and the guests come back. And that's really the fundamental business model that drives every decision that we make. But I would say the things that are most important are just the core values related to embracing change. I think certainly this past year, we've had to be very flexible. We've had to adapt and adjust on a lot of levels, both from the guest experience side, as well as like where we put our resources, how we try to drive additional revenue, how do we get that guest loyalty experience, everything. I mean, all different aspects of the customer journey are touched on. And I think the big thing is, um, you know, from a company standpoint, another big core value is this idea that we have the spirit to serve, that we continue to embody that we welcome everybody and anybody. We want people to feel like we are their home away from home. And that when they come to our different properties, I mean, we have 30 brands. I think that's what's so amazing is we have everything from the Ritz Carlton to extended stay options like Residence Inn or some of our select brands like Element or Aloft, you know, there's just the whole gamut of spectrum of experiences. So just encouraging people that when they come, they just feel, again, welcomed and that they really want to be loyal to us and that they'll feel that sense of like, I want to go back either personally or professionally, like for that next leisure trip, business trip, meeting, whatever I have to be there for too. Awesome. Well, I definitely have stated many of the brands and I feel always welcome. 
Um, I did see that you're launching this really exciting campaign as we come back to travel. And I saw you guys are engaged in some new channels like TikTok, which I think is unusual, but it was very good. And I, I took a look at the new plug and it's awesome. Can you please tell uh, the audience about um, what it means for the new campaign and how it's going to impact um, all of your 30 brands. Sure. And so, as you said, um, we launched this new campaign just a couple of weeks ago. It's all about the power of travel. And the idea is that, especially after this past year and a half or so, we know the restorative power of travel that it brings, that it connects people. It's really in the spirit of growth and healing and unity that travel is something that people I think if anything, I can speak for myself. Like I know I certainly um, won't take it as much for granted. I feel like it's not necessarily a given, it's a privilege. And it's just something that, again, was so important to me on multiple levels before, but I had this newfound appreciation for it. And I think it really leans into this idea that um, you can expand your mind, your horizons, like your corners of the world are not just for you, they're for other people to discover too. And so, in terms of the platforms and the channels, like you said, TikTok, this was the first time we had ever used that as a medium. So there were some really exciting placements when the campaign first launched where we partnered with influencers. We had some original content developed. Um, we also are doing some partnerships and activations with like Hulu in terms of in-ad placements. I know they're doing QR codes with Disney Plus, like just all sorts of different channels and visibilities and exposures because I mean, we all know we're experiencing so many different messages simultaneously and trying to cut through that noise. We did a lot of like just validation and research. Like we we know again, like we've all been talking about that travel is just such a wonderful experience that really does unite people, but it, it has this power. So this power of travel campaign, I think leans into that idea. And these new channels are just a great way to continue to get that message out there and articulate that value proposition. I love how the campaigns are so, um differentiated and they're they're very exploratory i mean i was wondering how uh, you guys chose the locations and um and, and the different influencers how how'd you guys select those so it was a combination of a lot of thoughts of like i mean we are obviously a global world right like we need to be representing like different perspectives backgrounds experiences and so i think some of the locations were really focused in on the different types of trip purposes like you know in the types of experiences that we see are most common. So there's this one spot that we have that I love where it's a family reuniting for the first time. And I mean, it literally makes me tear up just almost even thinking about it because there is that power in, again, people just recognizing how important it is to establish those emotional connections and that it's only when you're in the presence, like in the same company of your loved ones, your colleagues, like other people, like that you kind of get that feeling of, wholeness inside that you might not necessarily like experience like on a Zoom or Teams call or virtually. And so people have that, you know, newfound appreciation. And I think um, a lot of the locations and the scenarios were based off of what we're hearing our guests tell us. Like my first trip is to go visit my mother or my grandchildren that I haven't seen in a year plus, or I want to get back on the road and have that chance to do an in-person meeting because I miss my colleagues and I can't wait to just give my best friend at work a hug again, that kind of thing. So I think a lot of it is um, just leaning into what we know is right now, the real-time experiences, but also like what are the new and evolved expectations going in as well? Yeah. So um, I work with marketers every day. Uh, more on the technical side, we are a company that sells a CDP and we are getting a lot of brands coming to us trying to like talk about what post pandemic life is gonna be like. And there's like such a diverse message. So um, it's interesting to hear the creativity that you guys are coming out with. And then think about the technical side of things like how do you send the right message to those people who are thinking about traveling overseas when some you know, countries are still in lockdown mode? Or how do you, you know, find those people who are trying to get their families back together and, and uh, get the right message over to them? So many opportunities to really take such a wonderful campaign and think about the strategy on how to engage those folks most. And um, it's something that, you know, if anyone in the audience have had questions about how to do that, be happy to. But I love such a diverse campaign. I've looked at some of the channels and uh, I've also played around with the app and just it, it's it's beautiful to see 
all of the differences and I'm trying to engage more with it to see how the messages might change up for me. Mm -hmm. I, I have not gone back to work. I will be going back to work soon, but I also have a very overdue trip to Europe with my family and we're super excited about it. Absolutely. I mean, that's the thing, like, right. I mean, I think if anything, people, like I said before, are just going to have this newfound appreciation. And I think that travel is something that it really does connect people and unify people. And I think we were talking before, right, as you were jumping on that, like, there's this power in the planning. Like, I know when I'm looking at different options and researching and kind of going through that whole experience of, okay, where do I go? Where do I stay? What activities do I want to do? Where do I want to eat? Who can I, who am I going with? Like, whether it's with my immediate family, with like, um, friends, like with coworkers, like it changes, but there's something like about the just like anticipation of it. And then the actual experience, like we know people have really high expectations right now because they haven't been traveling. Right. So like there's a lot of pent up enthusiasm and demand and excitement just because that first trip, you're like, I can't wait to not only get on the road, but like get out of my house <laughs> you know, and just expand my bubble a little bit more too. So yeah. It's a good opportunity to make some new memories for sure. Exactly, exactly. So you touched on this a couple seconds ago, but I've, I've you know, the, the hospitality travel industry has really been impacted from an employee standpoint. You mentioned how much uh, you guys focus on associate satisfaction because it leads to um, travelers and your members' satisfaction. Can you give us a little insight into how you're ensuring that the guest experience is uh, supported by the associates as they come out from a kind of rough period. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that we can all say with confidence that like COVID has definitely impacted our present state of mind, our future experiences, and like people are coming at it from different perspectives. So we're very cognizant that for some people, it might be the first time, like you said, that they're going back into an office setting, that they're getting on the road, that they're interacting with colleagues like at our properties. And um, especially for our associates, like we want them to feel supported. And I think this whole idea of putting people first and making sure that like we're obviously having all of the different cleanliness protocols enforced, um, that they're up to date and informed in their trainings and just we have you know daily meetings where we talk about and we reinforce like this could be somebody's first time in a hotel stepping foot for 16 months like they have pretty high expectations again or they don't know even if they've seen it in the grocery store or at the bank like that plastic flexi glass might be a totally different experience like at a hotel versus like you know somewhere else so we just kind of are trying to reinforce the messaging of like you know again we're open for business we're here to welcome you when you're ready we want people to feel comfortable to feel like we're doing all the right things because obviously again it's um it's so important that like the cleanliness and standards are up to date and refined and evolved as needed but then just in general like you know whatever comfort level that our guests are giving us as cues, we will take that feedback. So some guests have said, you know, we don't necessarily need like housekeeping to come in all the time as we once did. We'd prefer, you know, to have less refresh or tidying or whatever it might be. Or we had a program, um, I was in a, a session this morning when we were talking about this. We've been doing um, a kind of on-demand room service, like an in-room dining program for several years. And that was just such a natural gateway when everything first started because it was based off this insight that like people don't necessarily want somebody coming into their room. It's a little uncomfortable. It's a long formalized process, but if you can just like order on your app and then have somebody drop off something at your door, minimal interaction, and it's pretty efficient in terms of the speed, that's the best of all worlds. Like, you know, if you're just looking for that sort of more privacy experience or you don't want to have that limited, again, um, interaction. So that was something that we had been doing. I was working on this project almost seven years ago, but we've been doing it. And that became like just such a great thing that we continued to execute over the past year or so because a lot of our properties like have that in-room technology or ability to like use QR codes to scan, to order, pay for the services, add a tip, et cetera, and then have limited interactions and stuff too. So we're just trying to really meet people where they're at, whether it's the associate side or the guest side, but just ensure that like it works on all ends of the spectrum and that at the end of the day, people feel comfortable and that they'll want to continue to travel and to come back again as well. For sure. I mean, I'd consider myself a road warrior. I've pre-pandemic, I was gone every week. Um, this first trip does have 
uh, caused me some hesitation, right? I'm going to be on Amtrak for the first time. I don't know what their protocols are. I feel a lot better about staying at one of your hotels in New York because of how you just explained it. But even that, even how you described the old way of doing things would have, uh, you know, a representative from the hotel, you know, push the the little table into it. And there was that formality of it. And it was always a lovely experience, but you're right. I probably am not so sure that I'd want a person like that in my room right now, if I could just have a transaction like I've been having over the last couple of years or the last year with, you know, every DoorDash or Uber Eats or things like that. Um, that, that is pretty cool. So you thought of it seven years ago, but who would have ever thought about the pandemic being, you know, the perfect storm for all those things to come to fruition. Totally. Yeah. totally. It's, it's really fascinating. I mean, you look at all of the different digital mechanisms, right? Like the in-app messaging or the contact list, the, like our keyless entry or check-in experiences. Like, I mean, so much of that has accelerated because of necessity, but it's also leaning into from a convenience standpoint, evolved expectations wise too. Like these are going to become the things that stick around. Like I know I am excited that like some things just out of pure convenience, like are going to be here to stay because it's just a little bit easier. Like, you know, I think about going to your, one of your favorite restaurants. Yes. You want to have that dine in experience, but if you're looking for takeout and they can bring it to your car or load up your trunk or something, that's like super convenient. And it's just that much more seamless too. For sure. I mean, there's been a ton of analysis on how life will be in the future. And a lot of it was, um, proofed out by the pandemic and how people want to interact with brands in the future. So I think it's a great experience. It's nice that you guys are so far ahead. Um, you know, I'm traveling uh, for work. I have to, but, um, you know, I'm not so sure that I'd be ready to take a, a trip to Europe. I can't right now for the places we want to go, but I'm going to have some hesitation with it. So can you talk to us a little bit about um, not the room cleanliness or those Kind of cool things, but from a marketing standpoint, like how are you engaging people to come back into Marriott or consider Marriott above another brand? I mean, there's a lot of road to catch up on, and I, we'd love to hear about from a marketing standpoint. Like, what are you guys doing to engage past members and and uh, folks that are considering, you know, coming to Marriott for the first time? Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with just setting the expectations up front. So we do a lot in terms of the pre-arrival communications, knowing that sometimes depending on local restrictions or regulations, like we, there were periods where we weren't able to always have like all of our outlets open, for example, like the restaurants were limited in terms of the services that they can provide. Thankfully, at least domestically, like a lot of things are being involved and opened and up, back up and everything. But, you know, until there were local restrictions that were lifted, like it was impacting us. And so just having that transparency and communication so that our guests know, you know, if they're coming to our hotels, like, I mean, we just launched a great partnership with Uber Eats, right? So like that could be an option if for whatever reason, like something wasn't available on site, you know, just having that as a backup, for example. Um, but I think in general, just the importance about like transparency of information. And I think what we've seen over and over again is that our guests, like, they're very willing to like, you know, offer up their opinion. Like they, they're wonderful at filling out our guest satisfaction surveys. They participate in online forums and communities and panels where they give feedback. And then also just like engaging with our team. Like we always encourage our associates to just obviously keep their eyes and ears open and do observations or like, what are the common topics or things you're hearing about? But I think the big thing is we wanna make sure that we're providing that transparent information so that we're setting the expectations from the get-go and then hopefully even elevating if not exceeding them. So when they come to the properties, it's like, you know, they have a baseline for what they know what will happen, but then if it's even better than they expected, like those are the surprise and delight moments. Those are the things that keep them talking or have them recommend to other people or share their experiences on social media. And so we're just always looking at kind of like what's the chatter out there or paying attention. I know when I used to go to a lot of our properties, like one of my favorite things to do would be just to talk to guests, you know, and I understand now like it's a little bit more limited, but I think, you know, just hearing directly from guests, like, what do you like? What do you not like? Is there something we could be doing better? Or, you know, we're so glad to hear that you've had a wonderful experience. Like, you know, would you mind sharing? Or if you do share, you know, please come back and visit us again. We'll look forward to seeing you the next time kind of thing. And 
I just think being really transparent and open and honest is key on both sides there too. Yeah, I'd agree. It sounds like you guys did some reg regionalized messaging for the pandemic bases, different areas opened up. Do you think you'll continue that, that methodology? I think too, in a certain extent we have to because of just like some of those local nuances and given that things are kind of ever evolving and real time playing out. I think the big thing too is that we do want to stay consistent in our messaging. So of course, you know, like having that holistic strategy piece, like thinking at a macro level is really important and how it's either localized or experienced like at a regional level, I think is sort of um, determined by what's happening in the market and the conditions at the time. But I think like it is, it, you know, we know that like it's never going to be a one size fits all and that there are going to have to be adaptations or adjustments that we make real time, given like certain things like, you know, might be on our control or if situations change or if there are like things I'm thinking like, you know, if strains evolve in the future or if there are nuances that we have to kind of consider, we just have to be ready to on the fly adjust and adapt. Yeah. A lot of our customers are asking us how to do that. Like how do they communicate regionally? How do they communicate how they've interacted with the brand? Um, we have some travel companies that are like, how do we market to people who are comfortable coming back? And we know that they were looking for a trip before the pandemic started and how do we re-engage them? So there is a good deal and a good opportunity for brands like Marriott. It sounds like you're doing some of it today and other people in the industry to do hyper-segmentation, to know more about the consumer and meet what their needs are digitally. And I think that's that's pretty neat that you guys are doing it because there are a lot of people who you know, want to start traveling, but have some hesitation or they just don't know. Like I was um, actually getting my nails done the other day and someone was talking to me about going to Paris this summer. And I said, oh, is France open? I said, I was looking to book a trip to Madrid. And this very informed woman said, oh, Paris is open, but Spain is not. And it's hard to like navigate, at least for me, and I consider myself pretty digitally savvy, like what the rules are right now. So it's great when a brand can communicate that with you. And um, I think it just makes it a better customer experience for sure to have that kind of specificity and messaging. Definitely. And as you said, like, I mean, as we're kind of all experiencing like what this will look like and knowing that there are those differentiations and nuances, like it's real time that we're trying to um, just have it all play out. So yeah, I hope you do get to France and uh, <laughs> I know you want to earn to Madrid as well too. Yeah. Just mean, yeah. I'll go to any place right now. I'm, exactly. I'm ready to, you know, I, I'll have to prepare. I have some hesitation, but I'm, I'm ready to get back on the road with my family. Um, switching a little bit to the future, you've talked about like the experience and being able to differentiate messages and have, you know, right kind of, you know, engagement with customers real time and digitally. Um, but for a lot of companies, they've taken the time to figure out what does the future look like for us? Like, are there opportunities to, I don't know, build additions. Uh, I'm on the board for YMCA and while our gyms were shut down in Delaware, we painted all of them and we got new equipment in because we had some downtime. I'm sure Marriott's changes would be different than the YMCA, but um, are you guys thinking about anything differently for the future, like amenities or campaigns or, uh, you know, how you let a customer depart? Like, is there anything different happening? I think so. I mean, I think again, as the buildings have been repurposed. Like, I mean, we were one of the first companies to offer like on-site testing capabilities, um, especially oh, people are coming for like meetings and events, like our connect with confidence program. So we established like a program where people could join hybrid to meetings or they could be in person, but just the ways, I mean, you think about like everything, the room setup, the food and beverage experience, the technology that was deployed, like all of that, I think was one thing. Um, I think in general, just, again, this idea of meeting people where they're at and feeling out various comfort levels, knowing that people might want to lean into something more than others. So um, we evolved like some of our food and beverage programming where, for example, like we had like a couple of our hotels, they did like on demand, like happy hours or like, you know, beverage carts that would come room to room or that would be in certain locations set up throughout the hotels and everything. So just again, knowing that, um, people have different experiences and that they want different services or amenities in general. 
And I think, um, you know, just in terms of like the market, like where we're going, like location wise, we have, so, we, I can't even keep track. Like, I want to say we have over like 7,400 hotels at this point, maybe even 7,500. And, you know, we're in so many different locations, but we did this great partnership with like the National Park Service last summer because so many people were doing road trips or domestic and drive to markets and everything. And I think having the opportunity to like, you know, get us in locations to have properties that are a little bit closer to some of these more desirable or interesting destinations in addition to the like urban markets or the amazing resorts and stuff too. So I think um, just trying to like, again, pay attention to what is that new experience or what are the preferences that are going to drive not only loyalty and return to visits, but word of mouth and dorm endorsement and just the, um, I think in general, like this new experience or, and what they're expecting that it is going to be the future state too. So um, I mentioned in the beginning and I talked about how I'm a loyal loyalist to your brand, but I don't think I looked at the app so much. Um, so there's definitely some things I missed. If I wanted to find out what's going on in the future or what's happening right now, like where's the best place for me to find that information specific maybe to my location or other programs that you guys are having, like the national parks and things like that. I think, I mean, we do a great job. Our news team is constantly pushing out like great releases. You can sign up for alerts. And I mean, I think about some of the partnerships that we've done with um, not only like programs and partners, but also just in terms of like new development and locations, like properties that we're opening. I mean, there was some stat, this was about a year and a half ago. So sort of like right in early part of 2020, where we were opening like on average, a new hotel, like every 14 hours. I mean, it was just gangbusters in terms of the amount of new properties and everything. So I would say on our news channel site, like news.marriott.com is just the source where we have a lot of the releases. Um, but then certainly on the app, like where you have some of those push notifications and messages that go through as well. And I think um, in general, like, you know, all of our channels, like all of our proprietary channels, we have great resources that are constantly tracking and monitoring, like from a social engagement standpoint. And then at the local level, at the property level, like a lot of our properties obviously have their own handles or um, accounts and feeds where they're responding real time. And they're trying to have those moments where like I hear stories of um, people that go to our hotels that post an Instagram photo and then, you know, they've tagged the hotel and maybe like, a couple hours later, they go back to their room and there's a framed print of that Instagram photo. Like, in the, and those are the kinds of things, like, I mean, they're, the associates get so creative with the thoughtful gestures and just in general, like, I think that personalization and leaning into like this idea that people feel like acknowledged, appreciated, recognized, like we're trying to just make sure that, you know, knowing the stakes are high, right? We want to try to deliver however we can too. Yeah, that's a very savvy social media team too. Yeah, they're very that's pretty I, impressive. I've, I've not everywhere, but I've seen it. I've heard and I've heard of it, and it's it's impressive when it's executed well. So yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. oh, I would agree. Um, as a Bonvoy member, are there any kind of like all the things that you're talking about are so cool? Like, how do people get involved in like the beta programs to hear about the stuff and maybe be front runners with their friends and fellow travelers? So I think the big thing is, um, you know, definitely try to work on your status in terms of getting those different levels and tiers. And we've actually, you guys, you guys kept mine from yes. prior. So I love that. And I think I stayed somewhere and you guys gave me six rooms for one or something. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's continuing, but I thought that was pretty cool. Definitely. No, thank you. Again, this is why, like, I mean, candidly, before I even joined the industry, I had no idea. And now I have a newfound appreciation as to why loyalty is that much um, more impactful and important. Because, you know, when you stick to a brand and you're loyal to a program, like you not only obviously get those perks and privileges, but you get like that recognition that I think is like, obviously so important, but also like, like you said, you're working hard, you're the road warrior, you want to treat your family to this wonderful experience. And like, it's a way to like, you know, just validate and make sure that like, you know, going forward, it's something that you'll continue to appreciate. But um, so I'd say people like, you know, we're always looking to our members for feedback, like they, there is the Marriott Bonvoy Insiders community that's on our Facebook group, you can join that where I think that's really I, I'm always fascinated to hear some of the conversations like people will throw out there. I'm going to X destinations, which brands of these five hotels that are there should I stay at, give me the benefits, the trade-offs. And it's like their own little mini focus group that they'll do among members. 
Um, we have panels, we have like, you know, obviously we always encourage people to give back feedback in our guest satisfaction surveys. So typically we, we don't spam you, you'll get maybe asked only once or twice a year, like after your stays and stuff, but we do read every single survey and the hotels try to respond if there's any concern, but obviously if there's praise, we want to acknowledge that too. And I know for a long time here at headquarters, we had a scrolling roll of every single comment that was coming in because it was just so important to keep it visible and top of mind to everybody. Like this is real time what's happening. Like we want to make sure that we're engaged to the voice of the customer, what they're telling us, what's important from the guest experience side. So I promise you, those are the best feedback loop mechanisms we can ask for just in terms of staying up to date, but also like we, we take those very seriously and we want to try to respond accordingly too. Yeah. I, I love it when, uh, I will frequently use Twitter true confession as my way into customer service anywhere and travel brands have specifically done a very good job with um, responding right away. But I can only imagine, it sounds like you guys had a command center of good and bad and ugly, and you probably had lots of reps um, taking care of that uh, feedback and addressing those. So that's pretty neat to know that you guys take that so seriously. Yeah, it's amazing. I will just give a plug. We have this thing called um, My Live, which is like exactly like you described, it's a command center and real time, they monitor all the chatter, all the different conversation. And I think it's just so powerful because like we can not only thematically kind of understand what the sentiment out there, what's being talked about, but it's just, it's a way for us to address those issues. So like, as you said, if you were calling out on a handle or if there was something that came up, like hopefully it's resolved before it becomes a bigger issue or vice versa. If it's something that we had, um, it was a couple of years ago now when this whole command center was created, they just did some amazing activations where I remember it was when we had like one of our loyalty members um, check in and I can't recall what number he was, but he was like some monumental, like maybe like the 10 millionth member to use mobile check-in or some significant milestone. And so when he checked into the hotel, like it was like, you know, this whole celebration that took place, like, and I mean, he was there for, and it was at the JW Marriott at LA Live, and which is right next to the Ritz Carlton there. And he came and he checked in with his wife and they acknowledged, and then they did like a flash mob and they had like all these like balloons and streamers and everything. And it was just such a, like a viral moment. It was very powerful, but it, those are the kinds of things that I think like, had we not, like, I I believe that the reason why we identified and tagged him was because he had posted something like, hey, I'm celebrating my anniversary. What should I do while ah. I'm here or something? So it was a couple of weeks in planning in terms okay. of the process, but it was just, it was so amazing that we could execute that too. That's why I love data. I get nerdy about it, but yeah. I kept thinking when you're describing that, I'm like, well, what if he was an introvert and it just wasn't right. that <laughs> great, that great of experience. So when you explain how you figured out that he was an extrovert, that probably was honestly a great experience for him. And it's a lot of fun for sure. Totally. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, we're at a little after 110. Uh, are there any questions that the audience has for us? We have one QA. Um, okay, so this is from the audience, and the question is, is, I've seen Marriott start to offer up villas and homes. Can you tell us a little bit about the strate strategy behind that? I'm guessing to compete with Airbnb, but what is Marriott's future vision for it? Yes. So I'm glad that this question was brought up. So um, Homes and Villas is one of our newest brands. So exactly that. It's like a housing rental service. I think a lot of people actually don't even probably know about it, but it's um, kind of comparable to like, you know, some of the traditional competitors out there. But we have obviously like our own standards and protocols as it relates to what we will select as properties that can qualify for these homes and villas, as well as just in general, um, like some of the perks and privileges, like with getting points, redeeming points, like all of that is tied to it. So I believe I'd have to double check the figures, but like we are going global, like we started off in Europe and the US, but then there are plans to expand to other markets. And we have all sorts of different properties. I mean, you have the traditional like 
I know that there are some big beach houses in like the south um, of the United States. So like in markets like Savannah and Florida, we have apartment rentals that are in like places like Europe. We have Tuscan villas like in Italy. I mean, there are some really interesting and fascinating locations. But what we love about it is we know people want flexibility when it comes to their travel plans. So somebody um, might be going to wanting to have more of that homestay experience. And this leans into that. And it just gives the opportunity for families to travel for groups of friends to be together, that kind of thing. And I think um, the Homes and Villas is just a wonderful, it's growing like gangbusters. The team is doing an incredible job with just the distribution and the presence globally. I did check it out. Uh, and there are some lovely small homes that are cozy, but I did see some of those monster big um, ones. And it looks like that would be great for big family trips. Totally. And I actually, I just saw, I didn't, um, May, who's a colleague of mine, who's on the Homes and Villas team, she just posted into the chat that we have 30,000 homes in 250 de global destinations. So that's pretty amazing when you hear those figures. Oh, that's a lot. I'm going to really have to check that out further. Um, so that was the only question we got. Is there, are there any other questions that people have? Okay. Well, I have one last question for you. It's not about Marriott. Okay. But, um, probably a pretty wide known fact for people that know me well, but for this audience, no one would know this. I am a huge basketball fan, college basketball. And we have also several people inside of my organization that um, are Duke alums, as you are. So Coach K has announced his retirement. I think everyone is sighing. What do you think is going to happen? How do you feel about it? You hearing any insider scoop? Yeah, so it's funny you asked that. So I was so fortunate. I loved going to Duke for my MBA. And um, when I was there in 2010, it was the first year um, that since I've graduated. They've won again in 2015, but they won the national championship. And John Shire, who's now going to be the new coach, he was a senior that year. So while I was in grad school and a couple of years older, he was the one and was one of the co-captains on the team and leading and now is going to be the new coach. Um, I think it definitely, at least for me, it took me a little bit by surprise because especially with our rival UNC and I have two younger brothers and one of my brothers went to UNC for law school. So we have that kind of intra-family rivalry and everything with Tobacco Road there. Um, Roy Williams had just announced that he was planning to retire too. So it was sort of like, oh my gosh, and now Coach K, what's happening? But what I love is that um, the day after the announcement happened with Coach K and that it was kind of indicative that John Shire was going to become the new coach um, and knowing that they looked external and that they were considering other candidates, but they really wanted somebody who had had grown up with the program and has been on the team and everything for a while now. They, I think they posted like a, one of those like throwback Thursday or flashback Friday photos where it was John and coach K like side by side. And John was probably like 14, 12 years old. I mean, pretty young. Wow. And it was like dream big. And I just thought that was so cool that there was like that changing of the guard and the handing over of the, you know, program and everything. And I know um, people are going to like, you know, he's, he's left such an incredible legacy. I mean, Coach K, they have, we have this Coach K Center for Ethics and Leadership and Ethics at the business school. And he's been a guest speaker and lecturer, and he just does an amazing job. But I think that um, people are really, really excited about, thinking of the future of like the program. And like you said, college basketball, I think is just one of the most um, intense like rivalries throughout sports. And I love, I get very into March Madness. So I just- Oh, me too. That, Maybe I'll invite we'll you brackets. Back. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, well, we'll do some brackets the next time against each other or something. But it's just, I think that there, there's a lot of um, high hopes, but also just in general, like, you know, people are feeling good about John and about Coach K going forward too. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. We're sure. definitely going to- keep our eyes out for it. And I'm wondering if I can get a ticket. I do think that they'll be very expensive this year, but I'm going to try. That would be great. Yes. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you guys so much. I don't follow the college basketball so much, so I can't comment on that, but what a great session. Thank you so much. You know, I think what was a really great reminder was how important it is for everyone on your team at Marriott to really embrace their role in driving the guest experience, you know, and ensuring it's amazing with all of us getting excited to travel again. I know I am, you know, you really got to make sure we that you guys deliver when we arrive, you know, um, excited to hear about things going more digital and, you know, mobile, make consumers feel comfortable, but just kind of that experience with you, um, especially after everything we've gone through in the last year. And um, I do have one last question. 
are you still doing the demand on demand happy hours with the drinks delivered to your rooms? Because I'm going to be in Dallas staying at one of your properties next week and I might need to tap into that. Or is that the lobby bars are open now? So not anymore. They are. Yeah, most of our hotels are operating back at full capacity. And I think having the kind of pre pandemic experiences, I honestly think it varies by property. So I'd say check in. Hopefully, some of the pre arrival <laughs> communications will, you know, lean into that and give you kind of what you need to know before you get there. But, um, you know, I think it's something I'm in a afternoon session related to this food and beverage strategy too. So I'll bring it up there as well. <laughs> that, that seems like a really cool thing when you're just working away in your hotel room, especially with business travel, to just have somebody knock on my door with some, you know, happy hour beverages. That would be fun. <laughs> so thank you both for sharing the insights. And, you know, as a loyal Bond Boy member myself, I'm so happy to hear about the vision of the future and your commitment to listening to your members. You know, um, that's really great. Um, I'm never one who lacks on providing feedback. So <laughs> that's good to hear as well. So really appreciate both your time today. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for the opportunity. And thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Okay, up next, our next session, we're going to hear insights and thoughts from David Knapp, Director of Customer Site and Paid Media for American Express, and Jim DeAntony, Director of National Media Sales for Dish Media. Hi, David. How are you? Hi, how are you? Good, thanks. Thanks for joining us today. My pleasure. Ah. Hi, guys. Hi. How are you? Good, how are you? Good. Thank you much. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're excited to hear from both of you. Uh, thanks for being here. I've already done, you know, a quick introduction uh, for the audience to you both, but uh, um, I will let you guys just kind of take it away. Great. Thanks so much, Andrea. I appreciate it. Uh, thrilled to be here. Always, uh, always like brand innovators and what they bring. Uh, my name is Jim D'Antoni. I'm director of sales at Dish Media. And just 30 seconds on Dish Media. Dish Media, we help provide data-driven solutions, television solutions to marketers. We help their TV buys uh, become smarter. Most addressable, most uh, particularly addressable television. It's something that we helped pioneer about eight years ago. And we've certainly developed a, a certain uh, expertise in that area. And uh, when we execute buys uh, addressably, we execute them across Dish Media as well as Sling TV uh, and um, across both OTT and satellite. Uh, and we do that through Comscore. And uh, we also, as I said, uh, own and operate Sling TV. And uh, that has, has a very robust programmatic solution in the marketplace. But enough about me and Dish Media. I'm joined by David here, David Knapp. So welcome, David. Thank you. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the conversation. And uh, uh, why don't we just jump in and just start off with you introducing yourself and, uh, and what you do at American Express, maybe give us a little sense of your team and uh, the focus. Sure. Um, so as you said, I'm David Knapp. I'm the Director of Customer Site and Paid Media at American Express. And I lead a high performance, happy team focused on predicting customer needs and driving business growth in our customer digital channels. Um, specifically, that's the logged in customer site. I formerly ran an email marketing team, and I'm also expanding into paid media this year. And we are relentlessly curious and data obsessed. <laughs> that's great. Um, so in our prep conversation, you mentioned three key pillars that kind of drive us through your kind of North Stars, if you will, on a day-to-day -day basis, content, data, and technology. Uh, I'd love to hear, uh, you know, just you kind of contextualize that and give, give uh, the audience a sense of uh, how you, what that means to you and, and how you execute that. Yeah. So before I get into those three pillars, I just want to set the stage a little bit with some context. Sure. Um, I remember when I was trying to break into digital marketing and I had started my career in brand strategy. I opened up my own retail strategy consulting business at one point and I was finishing up my MBA. And everyone was telling me that I should be an unpaid junior intern if I wanted to break into digital. And I thought, hmm, I don't think that's going to work financially. <laughs> um, yeah. the ROI for this MBA. But I, fortunately, American Express um, thought that I had some transferable skills. And so they took a chance on me and uh, gave me an email marketing team to run. And I had absolutely no idea what I was doing. Um, and so I... Uh, I call together a lot of different disparate voices to um, figure out what to do. And 
what I found out is that you really need, like I said, three things, content, data, and technology. So I'll walk you through each one. Content is about ensuring that we're speaking in a human voice and that the message that we deliver to the customer is relevant to them. For data, it's about figuring out what information do we have from all of our different data sources to match that content to the individual customer? And then also how are we going to track and measure performance? And then thirdly is technology, and that's super important. And that brings me back to my original story of, you know, trying to break into digital. I understand why a lot of digital natives think that you can't break into digital from a different discipline. And it's because you have to have a certain base level of understanding of data and technology in order to imagine the most innovative experiences. So for example, um, one of the acronyms that I don't really love is EM um, because an email is not a scan of a, po of a postcard, a direct mail postcard. It is not the same thing as direct mail. There's so much more that you can do with an email if you understand how to stitch together the data sources and leverage technology. Uh, so those are our three pillars. Great, that's great context. Um, all right, so you're you're using email uh, to you know reach out to your customer base. Give us some uh, a sense of who your customers are, and uh, and you know I'm sure that it, it it ranges, but just broad, broadly, I'd love to hear uh, some details on that. Yeah, I love operating at the scale of American Express, and um, for the segment that I'm focused on with my team, it's the small business owners who have an existing card relationship with American Express. And because they're already existing customers, we know a lot about what they're spending on, what they're engaging in from a marketing perspective, and what tools and solutions we can offer them that are gonna be most relevant. And what I've found is that small business owners love their businesses. And so the more we can reflect their business in our communications back to them so that it's like they're looking in a mirror, the more they're gonna engage. And I've also found that small business owners are busy people. And so we have to make sure we get straight to the point with direct and tangible value um, and not romantic flowery language. Got it, got it. Okay, uh, and then, so in your, what's the cadence, the cadence is, is a monthly email you had said? Yeah. Um, when I was running email marketing, I produced what became the number one outbound loyalty marketing communication for American Express, and that is our monthly e-newsletter program. And with that program, we really are able to make the customer the hero of their own email inbox. And I'll give you an example of what that email might sound like. So it would say, Dear Jim, happy Tuesday. Thank you for being an American Express card member since 2001. At this moment in time, you have 64,589 membership awards points in bank. I see that you've booked a trip to Miami. Don't forget that you have access to the Centurion Lounge with your platinum card. And oh, by the way, you have $125 left on your $200 annual airline fee credit. Um, and then once we've demonstrated with that at the top of the message, all of those data points that we've stitched together and brought to the customer, we show that we know them, we show that we care about them, and we're able to then get them to scroll to the bottom of the email, um, which we've tested through eye tracking, and find out that um, they'll read about something like a business financing solution that we might offer them if we understand that they might have some cash flow needs based on seasonality of their business or whatever other solutions or tools we can offer to help them grow their business. Got it, that's great, it's great, it's, it's you know, it's, Using the data of their, you know, you know their, you know, everyday, you know, business dealings and week in week out, you know, but then using that and turning it into a potential solution for them, yeah, which I think is a great, uh, great tact. Um, you know, I'm sure uh, trying to, you know, work across a large organization like American Express, it, it could be tough to you know, gain cross-functional, you know, buy-in or whether it be. Uh, buy in across your 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 uh, your customer base uh, you know when you're talking about multi-year initiatives particularly when there's like a year-end fiscal goal we all have you know that, that those short term <laughs> so uh, just just curious how you guys approach that and, and what kind of success you've had in, in terms of that 
Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, when I started out in this role, I was convinced that I would immediately be fired. So that allowed me to take a lot of big <laughs> risks. And um, one of the things I did was I noticed that our senior leaders were doing all of these summits. They call these big meeting summits. And I realized the bigger your meeting, the more important you are. So I invited everyone that I worked with um, into a room. I called it a summit for digital innovation. And I threw out a lofty goal, which was 10x growth on our email uh, program. And I had the technology team, I had the marketing team, I had product marketing, product management, risk, legal, compliance, everybody was in the room. And what we found out is there's over 100 people that have to like push a button in order to get our email out the door. Um, it was amazing. And we threw out that goal. And then I also brought in um, external agencies. And because remember, I had absolutely no clue what I was doing. So I needed someone to share like industry best practices, competitive intelligence, some kind of new stimuli that could get the group to think outside of our blue box four walls. And um, it didn't help that, or it didn't hurt that the uh, agencies also brought free bagels because it was a breakfast meeting. I wanted to make sure. You know, you gotta throw some show in the water. Everybody in the room. And um, I thought, all right, forget about in your goals because I think it was like October, it was the end of the year when I started. And um, what can we do next year that will deliver? And we came up with this idea to build an API technology that would allow us to curate disparate data sources um, into one communication. And it was a pretty hefty investment, but together we were able to co-create that vision and make the business case to spend what was like 20% over the budget. I remember at one point there was a decision note. It was like, okay, we can build the technology just for your one use case, or we can build an enterprise solution that 300 email marketers can use. And there was actually like debate about this. And I thought, well, <laughs> as a shareholder, like let's just do the one for the enterprise and I'll worry about being over budget by 20% later. Um, and we built it, it's working and it powers the communication I told you about as well as a lot of other communications. Yeah, but that's, that's uh, a great example of just, you know, just leadership, whether it be marketing or uh, whatever silo you're in, but just, pulling together most, so many marketers work across and American Express is probably the ultimate example or one of them, large you know, organization where there's there's agendas, there's all sorts of deadlines and, uh, and pressures uh, and be able to lead in that situation is, is critical and uh, kudos to you. Thank you. Um, so the other thing you mentioned is just cause you could make a great souffle or just because you, you have a passion for a, a small business uh, doesn't mean you're trained as a, a, as, a, as a business leader. You're not formally trained if you're a small business. And that's just, those are just two, two examples, obviously. But there, a lot of these people are very passionate and very talented, but they don't have, you know, let alone an MBA, they don't have formal basic business training. And that's another great area that American Express's uh, services just come into play to, to, uh, to really uh, elevate, you know, the, the solution and uh, just the day-to-day -day results. So I'd love to hear about that, please. Yeah, I, um, in addition to the products and services that we offer um, for sale, we have a lot of free resources. And I can brag a little bit about a program from a sister team um, called Business Class. And it's something that started last year and it's really incredible. They have educational content that's free for small business owners or anyone that wants to read it, including articles online, there's a daily e-newsletter. One of the things I love is the Instagram live sessions that they do with um, small business owners and CEOs and entrepreneurs. And they talk about real day-to-day -day challenges. So for example, last year they did an event with Joey Gonzalez, who's the CEO of Barry's Bootcamp, which is a fitness center that I love to uh, attend on occasion. and they talked about what was it like to own a boutique studio at the beginning of the pandemic and how did they adapt their business for the virtual environment. Um, and all of the content that Business Class Live is creating has incredible reach because it's available free and virtually. And then, so this, the program is called Business Class? Business Class, yep. Got it. Uh... Uh, anything else on it's business class you want to share? Like flying business class, but it's also like a course that you not you know you don't get a, a degree yet. Maybe that's something we'll come out with. But it's got it. It's yeah, additional content for and, anyone that's interested in learning how to grow their business, and it's and great what, stuff. Yeah, what's been the some of the feedback from the small business owners 
from taking these tests. The customers are loving it because, you know, for example, the daily newsletter, when the pandemic hit, there were a lot of people that were saying, oh, should we stop talking about, um, should we stop talking about ourselves or should we stop sending communications to our customers? And we went from a weekly newsletter to actually a daily newsletter because the like we had double the open rates. Customers were really engaged and they wanted to understand what, what are other small business owners doing and um, how do we navigate this incredibly uncertain time? Yeah. I mean, it, it, I mean, talk about a guiding light during, uh, you know, a, a murky time for all of us uh, a year ago, uh, which is great. Um, so uh, another big initiative for American Express that seemed to be, uh, you know, somewhat reunited, uh, reignited, I should say, uh, is investing in uh, black owned businesses. Uh, and that's not, that's nothing new for American Express, but love to hear. Uh, maybe some of the background on that and then some of the things you've uh, uh, reinstituted or, or, or elevated, if you will, over the last year to 18 months. Yeah, so American Express has always backed um, different communities. And what we noticed is that there are some groups that were um, facing disparate challenges, um, especially during the pandemic and specifically black owned businesses we wanted to support we launched a billion dollar action plan where we're going to enhance our diverse representation and promote equal opportunities for colleagues, customers, and communities. And I really like that it's not just about one thing. Like it's not, we are spending a tremendous amount of money, $750 million um, in uh, procurement dollars in the US uh, with black owned businesses. But it's not just about spending money, it's also about providing the resources and um, educational opportunities. For example, we have a 100 for 100 program, which was based on an insight that female black entrepreneurs are the fastest growing segment in the small business landscape. And we wanted to support them with things like mentorship, access to funding um, and, very, and grants, um, different things to support the community. So we also are backing our colleagues and I'm really excited about the fact that we have had incredible content um, and diversity, equity, inclusion training for colleagues. And we've been able to um, bolster our diverse recruitment efforts, which have really helped my team as well. Terrific, terrific. I and mean, it sounds like American Express uh, and your team uh, specifically are leaning that area, leading in that area, which is, uh, which is great to hear and kudos to you. Uh, anything else on like coalition uh, to back black businesses? Is there anything specifically there? So there's a million dollar grant program for backing historic small businesses. Um, and there's a focus on underrepresented, or sorry, backing historic small restaurants, um, which are also small businesses. And there's a focus on um, those that are owned by underrepresented communities. There's a ton of different initiatives and activities in this space. And I'd encourage people to visit our website for more information. Got it, great. Um, all right, I mean, We've all experienced this, this great change over the last 12, 18 months um, uh, in, the, in the world, you know, broadly, obviously, and, and that's certainly affected uh, small businesses. Uh, but what, what is it that you and your team have done? What, are, are there any pivots? Uh, what's, what's different between 2021 versus 2020, you know, 2020, for instance? Yeah, when we started 2020, my team was strictly an acquisition engine. Um, so everything we did was focused on hitting a revenue target. And when we had to pause some of our programs in COVID, we stood up a really robust loyalty strategy that was focused on backing our customers, helping them maximize their membership with American Express, reinforcing the benefits of the products and the, um, that we'd already sold them. And then, you know, in typical um, corporate fashion, when we started to reactivate acquisition. We didn't shut off the loyalty. So now we have a hybrid approach. Um, my team is actually delivering four times as many personalized treatments as they were two years ago. Um, so it's an incredibly exciting time to be in the digital marketing space. And it's really about centering like customer needs and making sure that we're predicting what the customer needs and then tailoring the communication for them. So it's not just about buy this product, buy this product. It's really more of a full funnel approach where you think about, does this customer need to be made aware of the fact that we're not just a credit card company and we also have lending solutions for helping them scale their business? 
or is this customer um, starting to travel a lot and we need to convert them on a platinum card upgrade because um, we know that they're gonna see a lot of benefits there? Or is it someone that already has the right product set, but maybe they're not making the most of, of their membership? So we find what are some of those lesser known benefits? You know, there's over 40 benefits on the platinum card. So we pick out which ones are gonna be most relevant for them and then tailor that content to that customer. So it's really um, broadened our perspective on what kind of content belongs in our channels and what's going to help the customer um, get what they need. So you, you said the, there's 40 different, uh, can you give us a couple examples of those? Of the platinum card benefits? Yes, please. So for example, there's a lot of travel benefits like the airline fee credit. Um, we also have bonus points in certain categories like on airfare. Um, you know, when it's booked with American Express Travel. There are, one of my favorite benefits is the purchase protection program, where if you um, break something or it gets lost or stolen, depending on which state you're in, the, the insurance regulations are a little bit different, um, which makes it really tricky to market. But yeah. um, that's a really great benefit. It's like a little supplemental insurance baked into the card. Um, those are just a few. Great. Terrific. Um, yeah. And you mentioned, you know, the travel, because that's, you know, my, myself, my colleagues, you know, we're traveling, you know, we, we, that started about a month, month and a half ago in more earnest. Uh, I'm sure that's the case, with, uh, but are, are they, do you notice that, are, are they, or is it only some, some specific uh, small business owners that are traveling more? Or is that, you know, is that a broader trend there at all? We've definitely seen their return to travel um, in full force on the consumer side. I think in small business, you know, one of the things I, I think is super interesting, and I haven't looked, um, haven't drilled into this data, but I'll just tell you anecdotally, I remember when the pandemic hit and everyone thought business travel is over. We're never going back after, after Zoom. And I thought, well, what if you're in a different time zone? You know, <laughs> like, if, like we do business with Sydney, you know, we have offices in Sydney and um, Asia and it's like, I think sometimes it's helpful just to be in the same time zone, even if you're not in the same conference room. Yeah. Um, so I definitely think business travel will make a comeback, um, especially for uh, building the relationships at the beginning. Yeah, nothing, nothing replaces that face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, you, you know, you can, you can engage in a screen, but uh, it's, uh, you know, you're going you know, to influence more face-to-face, uh, -face, obviously. And that goes whether you're dealing with corporate or you're dealing with small business, no question. Yeah, and we, you know, because business owners travel, we also offer employee cards, which helps when, you know, if the business owner is not there, you have, you're able to um, issue employee cards to people within your business to help keep the business running when you're not in the room to make that purchase. That's particularly helpful, like if you're on a construction site, there's multiple properties and locations and you don't want the boss to have to be there to like buy an extra wrench or something. Um, and then we also have expanded buying power, which helps with, you know, as your business is growing, your spend capacity can increase um, based on, you know, obviously how um, the risk modeling works out, but we're able to make sure we're able to provide that financing to the customers as they need it. Got it. So you have platinum, you have gold and blue. Are, are those the three cards that you're so those are the main products that we're acquiring on, but then we also have a lot of, um, we're expanding well beyond the card. So we have recently acquired Cabbage, which allows us to um, offer a line of credit to businesses, as well as a business checking account. What is Cabbage? So Cabbage is a FinTech startup that we acquired and it allows us to offer a line of credit and business checking account to our customers and a lot of really exciting, um, op, you know, there's a lot of really exciting um, things happening in that space right now. Um, like I said, we're not just a credit card company anymore. We provide a full range of business financing solutions and educational resources for our customers. Got it. Uh, this is this was not uh, you know anything we discussed. But I'm just curious. Do you is there anything like uh, where a either a customer or not a specific customer, but a, 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 any where like what have you learned in terms of your, your customer base in terms of the, over the last year, they're traveling more, but have they, they've pivoted in a number of ways. There's any insight or any, any examples that you'd like to say, yeah, this would be worth sharing. Yeah. I would say that our customers like free stuff and bonus points. 
So the more that we can deliver tangible value to them, um, we've done extensive A-B testing and they want us to get straight to the point. They're super busy. Um, we've also noticed that customers are responding much more heavily to um, anything that's personalized to them. Um, like I said, they really expect us to know them and um, only talk to them about things that are relevant. And we have, one of the things I'm very proud of is our test and learn framework. It's super robust. And what I've noticed is a lot of people do testing in sort of a scatter shot manner where they're just like, let's just try a lot of new things. It's like, and then they turn it over to a data team and they're like, give me an insight about this marketing campaign that we just run in it. And it makes, that's not the best way to operate. Um, what we do is we wanna identify like, what are the scalable learnings that we can create with this test? What do we truly wanna learn that we don't already know? If we knew that it was gonna work, we should just launch it at scale. Um, and then we prioritize based on effort versus impact. And we're looking at things like content optimizations and targeting optimizations and really anything we can do to drive relevance. That's our team's secret sauce. So I say like reach times relevance equals results. And for me, you know, the theme I think of this event is consumer engagement. And what is more and more important is delivering that personalized solution and that relevance so that you're not just sending the same message to your entire list every day. You're really being thoughtful about what does this customer need? And we're able to overlap so many data sets. Like I said, we can look at categories that customers are spending in. We can look at how they've clicked or engaged in different emails or, or uh, website visits. We can look at different risk models, um, all kinds of things to make sure that we're tailoring that communication for each individual customer because nobody wants to be talked to as a segment. You know, nobody wants to be talked to as a millennial or Gen Z, or whatever. They want to be talked to as Jim or David, as an individual. Um, and that's what we found really successful in our marketing. Yeah, that's great. I mean, personalization is so key because, I mean, we all kind of get flooded by emails. Uh, but if, in, if in, whether it's a partnership or whether it's even just a just, you know, an, a cold call, uh, if, if it has relevance to me, I'm going to look at it. And then if, if, it stop, if it stops having relevance, uh, and particularly if I have a card, you know, and I'm, then, then uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to stop paying attention to it. I'm just going to move on. So don't waste my time, I'm sure, make, bring me value. And, and I'm sure that's what you're, uh, what you're focusing on, which is great. Yes. All right. Um, so as, um, just we've I've, I as, as as a leader I've I've made some pivots uh, you know certainly in the last year uh, in terms of the way I manage but can you uh, I'd love to hear you know some of your you know how you've changed if if at all uh, how do you lead differently in a remote situation this is no longer new uh, but it's still I think it's still relevant because some people are going back it's going to be a staggered approach to go back to the to the you know to the office but just uh, love to hear uh, some insight on that. Yeah, it's really been a privilege to lead through the pandemic. Um, my team engagement has really skyrocketed based on the leadership pivots that we've made. So I would say, first of all, is just like with our marketing, we're focused on individual humans. We've really taken a human-centered approach to backing our colleagues. So we're doing things like a weekly icebreaker at our stand-up where we get to know customer, our, get to know our colleagues outside of work. Um, asking things like, you know, what's your least favorite chore or where do you want to travel to when the, you know, when you're able to uh, return to travel, things like that. And that's worked super well in getting to know the person behind the, the worker that's, you know, meeting the deadline. Um, I've also, you know, learned a lot about letting go and releasing the need to be in control or to be the pace setter. And stepping back and letting the team, you know, I, I think of it as like a, a relay race where we pass the baton and the team is, is, has been incredibly supportive of each other. One of the things um, I think is super interesting as well is hiring people in a virtual setting. And I think that yeah. one of the things that gets lost is that like side by side, hey, I have a quick question. Um, so we've introduced things like, you know, I have, for example, on my team, I have six new hires this year because everyone keeps getting promoted. So um, I have done a lot of recruiting and I'm actually recruiting right now if anyone's looking um, for an entry level role. But um, 
we have introduced things like daily, you know, 15 minutes side by side, just so that people can have that touch point to feel supported and um, like we care about them um, as they're learning the ropes. Yeah, I agree with you. The particularly entry level, you know, sometimes it can be a 30 second walk down the hall to connect two dots. And as opposed to, oh, do you have 15 minutes for a Zoom call, et cetera, yep. you know? Yeah. Or even just like looking, you know, my leader was just telling me this great story about how um, kids today don't really know what their parents are doing because they're always on their phone. But like you're on your phone for a variety of reasons. Like in the past, you might be opening up a newspaper to check movie show times or you might be, you know, um, looking at a map to, you know, to figure out where you're going. But all of those tasks, including work emails, are all in the phone. So the visual cues are not um, sufficient anymore to help people just like shadow and learn. I remember when I um, started my career um, in, at a retail organization and I would sit next to my electronic production person and I literally watch them like hand kerning the type and checking that the font suitcase had loaded and all of these things that might have seemed irrelevant to my role as a producer, but really helped me understand um, the perspective of the different cross-functional members of the team. And so I do think that, you know, you can, like you said, you can replicate that in a virtual setting, but it, you have to be very intentional about it. It's not, um, it doesn't just happen serendipitously. Yeah. Yeah. And in terms of my, you know, the, 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 my industry that you know my, who I interface was just predominantly advertising agencies and and marketers, but like there will be no in office interaction for for quite some time next year, um, and I think you know that that's just it's it's there's there will be a slow kind of uh, return, staggered and uh, and and thoughtful uh, and safe, obviously. Um, but you guys are still working remote, and that's you know that's into the foreseeable future. We'll be back in the fall. Um, okay. a hybrid operating model. Um, but I, like I said, my team has really been thriving this past year um, in a way that surprised me at first, but in hindsight makes sense because we were so intentional about how we were leading people, making sure that we had, you know, we flattened our org structure a little bit and had um, more intentional conversations across levels. So we focused, my team said, we, you know, we focused on the expertise, not the title. Um, we've done things like resource planning meetings where as you know things were changing so fast and this program would stop and this one would start and making sure that we had the right level of resources devoted to each project um so we have a lot of really great routines baked in there we also stood up like a monthly operational learnings meeting so that if there was a breakdown from one project we didn't replicate that across the entire team because a lot of them do similar things um, but we would share and document process and things like that so there are ways to be successful um, in a virtual environment and, and to recruit, to onboard, to, to train. But I will say that my team is particularly excited about um, coming back to the office and having team lunches and happy hours and things like that. Yeah, that we, I, we just went through that, you know, about, about a month ago and it just felt so refreshing, Yeah, you know, just to, to sit there and laugh with your colleagues and, it, you know, and not that you weren't doing that on a screen, but doing it uh, in face, it just, it just, uh, it, it was great. Uh, no doubt. So, um, I, so far, I don't see any questions here, but I'm going to, I'm going to just, uh, th th throw another one at you is, I mean, what do you think some of your largest, your biggest challenges, uh, will be over the next six to eight to 12 months? Uh, you could, you, you could say challenge, you could headwinds, tailwinds, uh, what do you, what do you, see, what do you see, uh, some of the bigger challenges and where, and where do you feel, you know, you'll be able to pivot? So what I'll tell you is that my focus as a team, it goes back to the content data and technology. And I would say that I'm particularly excited about the data side. Um, as you know, there have been some you know, privacy changes in the industry um, that affect emails and um, pixels and paid media and things like that. Um, but I think that they also create an opportunity for brands like ours that have robust proprietary data to lean into that and synthesize that into relevant communication. I think one of the things that's so interesting about data to me is that um, for a long time, I think a lot of companies 
off, like outsourced it or they sent it offshore or they, they just didn't think of it as a product. And they didn't invest in things like consistent tagging um, when you're doing campaign setups or you know, clear nomenclature to understand what a table means or just like things that might feel back office. I remember there's a meme I was reading on a social media site where it was talking about someone saying, can you send me, you know, some quick numbers on this? And the person had like a SQL query where they're like, let me open this like perfectly pretty data table that does not exist, you know, um, or chart and graph for you. And it's, for me, I think there's just so much opportunity if you have the cross-functional collaboration between the different teams to identify the source of the data, ensure you're leveraging it in the right way, stitch the sources together, show it to the customer. Um, that's one that I think is particularly tricky and that is, like I said, it involves the technology integrations, um, which you can either build or, or license. Um, and for me, I think it's about identifying, you know, we, as we launch more and more products and we have, Robust, I don't know if you can hear my cat, she won't. <laughs> but um, as you have like robust um, incentive campaigns and things like that, it's really about how do we uh, arbitrate across those different offerings for you? And also how do we not just show the same reason to buy to every single person, but leverage um, the most meaningful reason to buy for you based on the stage that you are in your, your buying cycle. Yeah, back to personalization and yeah, super smart and that's that's great insight. Um, any seasonality involved, and in, or is there? Is, I mean, is there a you know a pre pre holiday push or whatever that you know wherever whatever seasonality and there may not be. But so just for us, if you're not in the office working, or if you're not like nobody's in the office right now, really, but like if you're not working, it's not ideal because I target small business customers. So for example, like. Christmas, not a big day for um, our revenue, Thanksgiving, um, Sunday, you know, so we have certain days of the year that we have to normalize for. I think it's hilarious every year when people are like, uh, February is a short month. I'm like, we knew that going into the year, um, yeah. into the forecast. <laughs> um, but I would say like the start of the year when, you know, normal business cycles, like when budgets get approved, people like to spend money. Um, and, you know, reassess what their solutions are. Um, we didn't talk a little, a lot about measurement, but one of the ways that we can measure um, that I find fascinating is we have a holdout for our email communication and we look at how much customers are spending on the product when they engage versus if they're in the holdout population. And I can tell you that we have, because of our scale, we can reach statistically significant results and we do see um, a pretty significant boost based on our loyalty communication. Um, just reminding customers of things that, you know, we work all day every day on the American Express brand, but then when you think about the small business owner, it's like a very tiny fraction of their life. Um, ideally, yeah. like, and that's by design, because if it's working, they shouldn't need to, they shouldn't need to worry about it. But as their business grows and their needs evolve, um, they might need to tap back in and, and see what, you know, what they didn't look at when they first got the card. Great. Um, anything else you want to share with, with, with the folks in terms of, in terms of um, whether it be uh, like, you know, what, what, what are some of your tailwinds? I mean, I think some of the, some of the tailwinds for you is the, the company you work for, obviously, and, and just the, the resources. But are there, and, and are there any tailwinds? I think another potential tailwind just for the business, small business owner is the economy is coming back, and it is it is a you know uh, a regional thing. For certain cities are further than others and more restrictive. And but just uh, just curious, uh, what, 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 where's some of the, what are you more, more opti optimistic about for the small business owner? Yeah, um, so I'd say two tailwinds are really helpful. One is um, in terms of unemployment rate. As, the, as people hire, their um, demand or their need for employee cards goes up. So as our unemployment rate falls, our revenue on the um, up employee cards goes up, which is super interesting and like unique for the commercial space. Whereas in the consumer space, like maybe you put your spouse on, maybe your nanny, maybe your kid 
you know, 18 years later, but like, um, you're, it's not like a weekly thing where you have to think like, did I hire anyone this week? Do I need an employee card? Um, so I'd say that's one of our tailwinds. And then the other is just um, our eligibility. So because we're in customer marketing, even if you're, if you're a customer, but our risk team has decided you're not eligible because they don't want to take the risk on you, then I can't sell you anything um, or a particular product because we, we assess our risk on a product by product level. But um, during the pandemic, the very beginning of the pandemic, we had great sales on loans and then we had to pause them. So um, that's when we pivot into loyalty. So now we're, we're starting to open that back up and it's been really helpful for our revenue. Terrific, terrific. Oh, hi, Andrea. Are we, uh, we're, we're right at two o'clock. So we're right at two o'clock. Start the landing. Thank you so much, David and Jim. David, it was really interesting to learn about all the free resources American Express is offering. I didn't know about those. Um, you know, for the members, those business class live sessions sound really great. One thing I also thought was pretty unique was how you guys moved from weekly emails to daily emails. You know, great way to just really understand and identify quickly what your customers were needing and wanting to hear from you more, not less in this time of need. I thought that was really, that was really great and interesting to hear about. Um, thank you both for your time today. Really appreciate you sharing how American Express is engaging more with their customers. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank, thank you. Sir. And thank you very much, David. Have a great rest of your day. Take care. You too. Okay, everyone. Wow. What an amazing day so far. And we're not done yet. We have two more sessions. Next up, we have a really fun session with Ashley from KFC and Catherine from Ground Truth that my colleague Izzy is going to uh, introduce for us today. last week and sort of had some really fascinating insights that I am excited to share with you all. Um, as you know from the prior panelists, Ground Truth is the leading location and ad tech company trying to find the right consumers and uh, the right audiences and 2020 and 2021 have been a challenge for us. Um, with the pandemic. And what I thought was really interesting in my conversation with Ashley um, was some of the pivots that she has been able to make with her brand and um, how it really varies globally. So before I go into some of my questions, I thought I'd back up a little bit and ask what you actually do, Ashley, as a director of digital strategy at KFC and what that looks like for you. Yeah, thanks, Catherine. So uh, my role is probably unique compared to a lot of folks that you'll be hearing from uh, over the course of the summit. Um, it really is an amalgamation of all of my past experience. So I have experience working um, at Starbucks headquarters. So, you know, retail, very similar um, and uh, working on Starbucks rewards loyalty. I have experience working at Amazon and e-commerce optimization. And so really this role kind of brings it all together. So KFC um, is the second largest QSR in the world. We're in over 145 countries and have over 25,000 restaurants. Um, the vast majority of our sales are outside of the U.S. So here in Plano, Texas, uh, we have a center, a global center of excellence, where it's our job to really set the growth strategy and prioritization of how we're going to grow over the next several years and take best practices and learnings from markets that are doing things well, share those learnings across the, uh, the other markets to help enable speed to market um, and different capabilities. So I oversee and, and find global partners that will help us uh, grow more quickly. Um, I uh, work with the markets on capabilities such as um, e-commerce launch, so launching web and app solutions, um, and then the optimization of those solutions. Um, we call it access everywhere, every way. So any sort of you know, digital ordering capabilities, um, CRM, uh, loyalty, performance marketing, and as well as developing uh, new capabilities. So identi identifying where our knowledge gaps might be in these areas um, and helping our markets develop a new digital marketing capabilities. 
That sounds like a lot of hats you're wearing. <laughs> it is. It is, but I enjoy every single one of them and I, I have trouble letting go. So I just uh, work with really, really great people that help me make me look smarter than I am. Oh my gosh, no, I'm sure that's not even true. But here is my question for you, because you are doing a lot of different things all the way from, you know, the access everywhere, anytime to e-commerce. When you are at, at the global level that you are, is it different, obviously, in all of these different markets, right? Um, and then how have you been able to adapt to this um, giving customers control over when, how, where they feel safe accessing during the pandemic? Yeah, I would say every market is different. And that's why we, uh, KFC operates in a very decentralized way compared to a lot of QSRs. Um, our 145 countries are divided up into 18 major business units. And those business units have autonomy to make decisions and run their business um, the way that they think is going to be most beneficial to them. And so it's my job just to help them and to provide them with information and capabilities to, to enable them to, to be better, work faster, work stronger. And so um, it's been really interesting because when we, when you know, when the pandemic happened, we had some markets that had e-commerce already, and um, they you saw that uh, they didn't skip a beat um, when when everything started to shut down. Um, and then we had some markets that hadn't launched anything, and so for them it was how do I get an app? How do I get digital ordering as soon as possible? Um, so you know the focus was was very broad, um, and then we also found that um, just the way that the pandemic um, the way that got different governments um, handled the pandemic also changed the way we had to react and adapt um, because some went into a complete lockdown. QSRs weren't even open and other markets like ours um, still at least allowed for um, for drive through um, or for delivery during certain points in time and other you know, other countries didn't allow for that. So um, yeah, it was, it was quite interesting, uh, but it was a really great adventure that just continues to grow. Oh, it just keeps continuing. It's true. Yeah. So, and so you were already a decentralized model per se, right? So that, and in some ways, I feel like that may have been an advantage for KFC to people to adapt real time to their particular countries or rules, if you will, it sounds like. Absolutely. Definitely. That's great to hear. And so now that you say the access everywhere and every way, um, that sounds like a really big push towards giving customers what they want when they want. And, and you were already heading that way anyway, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that's yeah. really great. And so I have to bring it back to this whole consumer comeback since it's the theme of this. Um, how have you adjusted your messaging in the pandemic? Like how has what you were originally intending to do um, changed? And of course, once again, that's probably a very loaded question since you do have all these different, you're global. So I'm sure that's changed, but how have you been able to either shift sort of what you were going to do or inform people about new offerings in this pandemic? Well, I would say, well, we, you know, while we operate, um, decentralized and each of the markets kind of are able to react in the way um, that it makes sense for them, the collaboration at our organization has never been stronger. And I mean, we were meeting regularly across different markets to understand and learn and adopt from one another. And we actually found a lot of similarities in what our messaging needed to be. And so we essentially in almost every single market, we just stopped doing LTOs. Uh, last year, we said, you know what, with everything changing so rapidly, it's better for our customers to not throw some new information at them. It's better for our supply chain. It's better to enable to ensure that we're just producing our core products and we're doing them extremely well to provide customers with the great fried chicken that's going to make them feel and give them this like home tree feeling during this time. Um, so that's one thing that was was very similar. And then we tested um, some things in different markets that, that just continue to be adopted um, across the world um, and by doing more with what we have, rather than launching a bunch of new products, um, how do we adapt the core products we have to this changing environment and situation? So in the US, 
Um, you probably, um, I think most of the attendees are, are in the U.S. You probably saw the $30 fill up. So the $20 fill up is something that uh, the team has regularly, and that's a bucket of fried chicken with sides. Um, and they knew that if customers were, you know, having to pay these delivery fees in order to get uh, food delivered to them, let's make sure that they're getting more for that fee that they have to incur. So by they did the $30 fill up of adding, you know, tenders um, to it. And so it's a meal for tonight and then a meal for tomorrow so that you're, you know, getting more um, for, for what you're planning. We had markets that um, also adopted a similar approach of um, buying for multiple occasions in one purchase and would um, you leverage social media to get creative with how you can use your leftovers and rework them into additional meals so you can kind of stretch your dollar and you can stretch uh, your meals further. Um, and then I think what, what ultimately the big culmination of how we came together as a brand to change our messaging was really um, the removal of our tagline. Um, you know, no tagline is more inappropriate during a <laughs> pandemic than finger licking good. It's the you stole my thunder on my next question because oh, that God. is, I was like, wow, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. Like every, the CDC, everyone's telling you, don't put your fingers to your face. And we're saying, lick your fingers. Yeah. So uh, we had our first ever global campaign and said, you know what? We're killing the tagline and we just, we pixelated out um, the finger licking part. Um, and then we um, and just said, you know what? We're just pausing it for now. And then we had our customers kind of fill in the blank. Um, and oh, so that was really fun. And especially looking across different countries, across different languages, how customers were filling in the blank. Um, and we've got some really great ideas and submissions and engagement with our fans. And then uh, we entered um, a phase toward the end of the year uh, or beginning of this year where we just stole taglines from other brands. Oh my and gosh, I love it. It's like real <laughs> marketing on a global scale, of course, but it's so great. Yeah, I mean, yeah like you it's get... still not okay to use our tagline. So uh, Red Bull, we're just going to steal yours for now and say KFC, it gives you wings, uh, which is a little, you know, play on words because different so kinds brilliant. of things. So um, brilliant. But it was really fun. It's I take absolutely no credit for this campaign. It was my <laughs> colleagues, you know, Amy Dorini and Tori Carter. They really led the charge um, at a global headquarters. But just a great example of how our markets kind of came together during this time uh, right. to collaborate. Well, and I think it it goes back to your earlier point that Kentucky Fried Chicken and KFC is such a comfort food. And to try to make some sort of joy for people in a time where a lot of things were uncertain and to have this constant great food available and giving people value at this time is just such a brilliant brand play across the globe and in the U.S. in particular with the delivery too, that they're getting more for that. I love that. Super smart. So tagline come in, you know, are we, are we still playing with it? Are we going to come back with finger licking good? What, you know, what are the thoughts on that? Yeah. What you'll see is that different markets have already brought it back because okay. everyone now is in different stages. I mean, it Got made it. sense for us at the time because we were all as a world, we were all in this together and we, but some markets have already started to kind of come back and open up. And so they're Got trying it. to bring the tagline back. But other markets like our friends in India are still in really dire situation right now. So uh, we're really letting them, you know, e each market is kind of choosing when it's appropriate for them. That makes complete sense. Um, and let, let's go to vendors and partners really quick. We had touched based on this. And I think something that you brought up, which I found really interesting is, is that you're going a million miles a minute and you are planning so many different executions and strategies and you have so many needs for your business. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to ask is how vendors and, and partners can work with you in smarter and more thoughtful ways and adapt to your needs um, other than just media, right? Like how else can we help work with you? Um, I think first and foremost, we look for partners that are really going to be thought leaders with us um, that are gonna help us to develop customer-centric solutions 
um, as opposed to just trying to sell us their product. Um, really understanding, hey, what are our business challenges as a brand, as a company, and how can they help us solve those business challenges? Um, not just now, but in the future. Um, and not just trying to like, sell us a product or service now, but help demonstrate the way that we can grow and adapt um, with it. So I think thought leadership is definitely one. Another one is um, partners that really lean into their strengths. So if, um, if a company is trying to tell me that they are an all-in-one solution and that they can do everything, um, it makes me hesitate because right. not everyone is good at everything. Um, I know I certainly am not. <laughs> and so it's really important. It's like, hey, just lean into, you know, we had a particular um, potential partner that I talked to last week and he and I asked, well, do you do this? And he goes, no honestly, and I wouldn't recommend you use us for that. It's important that you diversify. And I was like, thank you. That's so transparent and honest, honest, you know, he said, we, we do this. We're really, really good at this. And we're not going to pretend to be something that we're not. Um, and um, that I think is, is extremely important. And especially as we're moving to um, an architect technology architecture and a MarTech architecture of a microservices approach where we want to um, find the best of the best at different solu solutions and bring them together for um, an overall customer experience um, that becomes really important. I think that's so smart and you know to elaborate a little bit further on that it's that not everybody can be an expert at everything. Like I know what ground truth is really good at, but if you ask me to do something else, I would have to be honest with you and say, no, that's not our strong suit. Because I think at the end of the day, it's okay to have multiple partners to your point. Yeah. Like you know, not everybody has to do everything really well and be wary of people that say they can do everything well because <laughs> it might not be the solution that you need. And that's refreshing yeah. here too. Um, and another thing that you had brought up too is leaning into your strengths, right? So it's like people that can do one thing really, really well, that can be that partner for that. And then you have somebody else measure it. So for instance, we are really good at um, do, giving you people and driving tr foot traffic to KFC. If you want somebody else to measure it, we suggest that because we don't grade our own homework. So if you need that third party verification, go with somebody else, which that's just exactly what you're saying. Um, another thing you had mentioned to me, since you do cover so many countries and you are on global, that partners that have global scale are important to you as well. Is that correct? Yeah, that's very important. Um, you know, it's really hard for me to spend a majority of my time or for us to invest in a partner that can only be a solution for one market. That doesn't mean we don't partner with them, but that's when I say, hey, go and talk to so-and-so in that particular market, find out if you, know, if you can help them. Um, but I have to, I focus, my focus is the whole world. So I'm looking for partners that are gonna help enable us to become a stronger organization on a global scale. Um, I, there are more, there are, we do have partners that, you know, are, are only solutions for, for one or two markets. And that I'm totally fine with that. And I partner with them and I talk to them regularly to say, hey, how can I find someone like you in um, the Middle East? How right. can I find someone like you in like, in, in the Asia Pacific market? Like you are a great partner to us, but uh, since you can't scale, can you help me track down someone that can help us? Right. Um, and so that goes back to that thought leadership uh, I was talking about of, yep. um, a, a, of helping us outside of the particular product or service you're trying to sell. Yeah. And that makes sense. And if you can find somebody that can recommend somebody great, that is, that's helping you get further in your job. So I get that. Um, another question that we are, we are really fascinated by is all the changes and shifts that have happened this past year and a half, uh, year and three months. What are your predictions for the industry in 2021? Like, do you have any, what you think you're going to see more of coming out of this? Yeah, I think there's a few and I'll look at 2021 and, and beyond. I think in 2021, we're going to continue to see that convenience is king. I think customers have gotten used to digital ordering. They've gotten a, a used to diverse ways of ordering and access brands. They have 
more choices than ever before um, than uh, for any type of uh, occasion that they're looking for. And I think we're going to continue to see that even increase. We're going to see more and more um, aggregator solutions coming out, more and more of these like combining um, of, of ordering experiences and different ways to, to pick up and, um, and access food. Um, so I think it's going to be similar to the streaming industry, um, you know, that we're that we're seeing where we're going to have um, a lot. I think we're in parallel paths with the streaming industry where we're getting a lot of diversification and then there's going to be a tipping point and it's going to kind of uh, maybe go down to just a few that are going to survive. So it's going to be a very interesting space to watch. Mm -hmm. um, I also think that we're going to see um, technology innovation um, that's going to then capture that change in that evolving customer behavior. So um, I, heard, I, I, I was talking to um, a partner of ours, uh, Yext, recently, where they were talking about the change um, that, that they're predicting in search and how it, be, um, which I thought was fascinating, um, of how it's going to become more conversational. So we've uh, piloted conversational commerce um, as an organization, really leaning into technology and um, enhancements that are coming in the space. Um, and then the prediction that that's how search is going to be too, not just based on keywords, but um, answering your question with the question to kind of help you whittle down your solutions uh, mm -hmm. even further. So wow. I think that's going to continue to evolve and, and, and happen very quickly. Um, and then finally, I think we're going to continue to see that brands that do more and provide more are going to rise above the top. Um, brands that do more on a social um, for a social good. Mm -hmm. um, brands that um, put people first, put their own people first, um, and lean into um, helping people just become better versions of themselves. Um, and then, you know, brands that are, are looking to provide more to customers than just the initial product or, or service they're trying to sell, um, that are helping create really great content or, you know, in some terms that might be some, some sort of loyalty schema and others it might just be um, becoming content creators. So I think we're going to continue to see brands reach beyond their initial scope. Absolutely. So it's it becomes less and less about transactional and more and more about the value to the end consumer. Yeah. I love that. Absolutely. I love the idea that you are giving um, tips and tricks with leftovers and what to do with them too. I think that that's such a nice value yeah. to people. Um, I love that. And I think one of the other things that we talked about is just the convenience of everything, right? It's really about what makes this user experience not only at ease, but it's really get, not giving them only the value, but it's like, it, it's just a very easy choice for them. And there's going to be more and more diversification on how, what that looks like to the end user. I love that. Um, and back to something you said earlier, which is really interesting, because I think we've seen this global shift um, in 2020 and 2021 about doing well, um, doing more social good for the greater good. Like it, it's not enough for a company to provide just a service. It really matters what they stand for. Could you talk a little bit about Yum as a global organization and how they've continued to invest in their employees and maybe some of the best practices that have been developed in this pandemic that may keep going forward? Well, I think one of the things that's made us um, very successful during this time is just it's our culture um, and how we treat each other and how um, the company just invests in, in its people. So, you know, we're grounded in being a heart led high performance culture from a high performance perspective. We want to be the best. We want to do the best and we are continuously pushing for more um, and we want to make sure that we can we can have an impact and grow the business. And we have high performers that are given the autonomy to do just that. But, you know, a lot of companies talk about how they're a people first organization. And I've worked at some really big companies and I have never experienced a company that walks the walk the way that that Yum does, and, and especially KFC. Um, they, we really see each person as an individual and so, uh, we want everyone to bring their unique and authentic self to the table. And we think that's how we're going to have a di diverse ideas and a, di a diverse approach to growing the business. Um, and we, 
and the company really put that into action during a time when most people were distressed. Um, we were too, we were working longer hours, yeah. 6 a.m. Yeah. calls, 10 p.m. calls. Um, but we just have a, we have a very flexible work culture and environment and that's here to stay um, for, the, for, for us for the future. Uh, the company gave us extra mental health days to make sure that we were doing okay. Um, constant reward and recognition for the work that we were putting in. I mean, my family was, would talk all the time. I would get another package on the front door and they're like, what are you getting now? I'm like, oh, the CFO sent me tips, treats to thank me for doing, you know, for helping out with this presentation or, oh, I got this t-shirt from, you know, from, you know, this country for, you know, helping out on this project. Um, and just having fun in what we do and recognizing and rewarding each other um, you would think that that would become more challenging when we're in this like remote working environment. Right. It really um, was just made, made stronger. Uh, we just had to adapt into new ways of recognizing and, and rewarding one another. Um, and it was, it was so amazing to, to be a part of that. That's amazing. So it sounds like you guys are definitely stakeholders, but you go with your entrepreneurial spirit and you're rewarded to do that. And people recognize that. I love that. So some of the things that you think out of this pandemic that may be here to stay with young brands and maybe KFC in particular, like some, give me some examples of best practices that maybe that your company um, will continue on doing. Um, definitely having this kind of flexible working environment. Um, we've had some people that, you know, some people want to go back to the office. Some people want to stay working remotely. Um, and we're going to provide the flexibility for everyone to, to feel comfortable doing what's important to them. Um, you know, I think so that's here to stay. Um, we've uh, attracting talent and being flexible with where they live and not if we if they want to relocate. Great. Yes, we'll pay for you to relocate. That's fine. Um, come on down to Dallas. It's a great place to live. Um, but uh, you know, if you don't want to relocate, we just hired a couple people though, uh, that live in LA and they don't, they want to stay in LA. That's fine. Like stay in LA and you know, we can, we can remote in. We have, and my team, we have someone in Moscow, two people in Australia, one person in LA, um, and then three, four of us here in Dallas. Uh, we just, we're just having someone join next week from Chicago. So I mean, just having that flexibility to do what's best for you on a personal level um, is definitely here to stay. That's great. And I think it's game changing. And I'm, and I think the best companies that are going to recruit the best talent, like you just laid out are the people that are going to be flexible and realize that everybody has different needs and you don't have to naturally necessarily sit physically together to get it done. Yep. So that's a great uh, practice. I think you had mentioned some other things that Yum um, instituted, um, like mental health days and a reward and recognition culture. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, well, that's, you know, the reward and recognition is just how our culture has always been. Okay. Um, we each kind of create our own personal um, awards. Um, mine, you might be able to see it behind me here, is the Wonder Woman Award. Um, yes. I'm on the top. Um, so I have a personal award that I give out um, for women specifically in the technology space that are making a difference and doing great work. Um, women are significantly underrepresented in that space and um, our company and me personally are um, looking for, um, you know, diverse talent and female talent that we can kind of infuse in technology and um, I make it a point to, to recognize those individuals and so that's, we each have like our own personal award that means something to us um, that uh, we create and we give and we recognize each other and everyone has ability to do that. I love that. And that's, you know, that's the name of the game is keeping everybody happy and injecting fun in what you do. So that was one of the things you said too. You said that the team is really fun because everybody recognizes how hard everybody's working. Exactly. Um, here's our other question. So this with the rise in digital ordering, which as you had mentioned is going, it's just the trajectory keeps going, right? How has um, organize, like organizational changes um, and what you're looking to invest in, like infrastructures or departments going forward and some of the learnings that were happening in COVID and maybe we're naturally happening that way, but some of the things that you might be looking to invest in. Um, so one of the things that we've been investing in over the past year that we're going to continue to do so is um, 
testing and rolling out agile ways of working. So working in an agile approach um, is really common in the technology industry. Um, a lot of developments and engineering teams work in agile, but it's just now becoming more common um, on the marketing side. So if you look at um, some of the top Fortune 50 com companies like Amazon, Microsoft, Nike, Facebook, they, they operate in this way, but it's very new for, for QSR to operate in this way. And that is with um, a fail forward mentality, kind of this ability to just test and learn and launch campaigns in an iterative way um, and adapt to changing customer behavior as opposed to spending nine months to plan something and then launching it. And um, we've tested that in over six markets um, and with amazing results. Um, that contributing to um, at least one point of same store sales growth in each of those markets and some, oh, wow. in some cases more. And we've um, been testing across um, e-commerce optimization, CRM, paid media, aggregator marketing. Um, and we have a backlog of over 600 successful tests that any of our markets can just pull from um, and start to um, test and scale out in their markets. And so that um, ability to work in a really fast, efficient way and see the return on that investment so quickly um, is something that we're leaning into um, and then can, going to continue to explore and roll out further. Oh my gosh, and to you, to, that's really groundbreaking in QSR, to your point, yeah. you see this in a lot of the tech companies, um, right? and you hear it about it at Facebook and Oracle, if you will, but this is really exciting that you're implementing the best of for KFC, I love that. Um, also, with attracting, so you've got to get top talent too, so attracting, attracting these people, are there different ways that you're um, looking at getting this top talent, you had already mentioned that you are agnostic to where people live now, which I think is a huge advantage for your company, right? Um, what are some other ways that you're attracting um, tech and digital talent? Um, I think, you know, in, a, in addition to just kind of putting together just a really great package, right, that will yeah. attract people to the company. And, and in addition to the, all of the great culture that we have that you can't find at a lot of other tech companies, um, you know, we are really the opportunity with our company because we're so new in the digital space in, in our industry is, is to really be able to make a difference and build something from the ground up and put your stamp on it. Um, and we find that that's really attractive to um, a lot of really great talent. Um, people who have this experience they in, um, already, they wanna make a difference um, and they wanna be able to deliver an impact um, and to have the autonomy to do that and that growth trajectory that can come from that, of yeah. building something from the ground up and putting your stamp on it and um, is, is so that I mean, so there's so much trajectory and room for growth um, that it's just really attractive uh, to people to want yeah. to kind of be on the ground floor and have that entrepreneurial spirit about it. For sure, and it sounds like that is overall a young thing as well. So, and then KFC in particular. So that's that's wonderful to hear. So I think without further ado, I'm going to open up some questions. I've gotten a few good ones, if that's okay with you, Ashley. Yeah. Um, here's a good one. What do you see as the biggest future challenge to retail and e-commerce and the biggest opportunity? Um, definitely the biggest challenge is going to be the competition um, because all of these digital channels have opened up. Um, it creates more competition uh, than ever before. And I think I alluded to this earlier, but if you just imagine, you know, if you were commuting home from work and you were trying to decide what to pick up from dinner, originally your brain would have gone to, okay, what's on my route home that I can just pop in and pick up or yeah. what's a, what are dry, what's a drive through um, right. because I don't have time to just, you know, sit there and wait. Now, all of a sudden, I can have anything delivered. It doesn't matter where the location is located. Um, it doesn't matter if I'm ordering from a, a dine with a traditionally a dine-in restaurant versus quick service because right. I can order it ahead and then just hop in and pick it up. And so right. now what used to be, what is drive-through on my way home, your options just went to like exponentially larger. Yeah. And so I think that's going to become our biggest challenge is how do we be distinctive and how do we stand out and um, with more competition facing us than ever before. 
Um, and from an opportunity perspective, though, uh, that's also the opportunity, right? You have right. access to more customers than you ever had before because your customer pool used to only be those people that were nearby um, that were looking for something quick. Right. And now you're like, well, you, oh, you don't have to be nearby or we don't have to be on your way home because we can come to you. Right. Uh, so, so it's being right. smart about your messaging and getting in front of that consumer in a non nonlinear way that you used to do. That's so true. Yeah. There's an other phenomenon that we just found out because I'm uh, the ghost kitchen too. There's uh, this yeah. whole other, you know, QSR, if you will, that's opened up and it's really yeah. fascinating too. Like who knew that, that this outlier was going to come in with no overhead that they have to pay, right? Like it's- yeah. I mean, ghost kitchens are great unless you have a secret recipe and <laughs> unless you have, you're very particular about how your chicken is made. <laughs> right. Well, we that's a whole other conversation. Yeah. I, it took me two hours to realize that Mr. Beast Burger wasn't a physical location. I was like, oh, <laughs> it's a whole new way of doing things. One of the other questions that was asked, which I think is great, um, how is the digital transformation of marketing and media industries impact brand marketing? That's an interesting question. It's a really interesting question. It's something that um, we're talking about every day and how we uh, create the right balance. So what percentage of our media dollars needs to go to brand and awareness driving campaigns versus what percentage of our dollars is going to performance driven campaigns? Right. And we're actually testing this right now in several markets. Um, and you know, we found, we did a test in Thailand where we had, um, in Thailand, we had 90% of their media was for awareness driving performance and 10% for conversion as the KPI. We just switched it to 80, 20, 80 awareness driving, 20% um, conversion as the KPI. Um, yeah. And we saw a 20% lift in our uh, conversion rate in our digital transactions. And okay. so we're starting to kind of make these micro changes in different markets of so looking at even of that. Um, and now we also have to look at, okay, what kind of of, um, we have still have to make sure that our, our share of voice is greater than our share of market, that we're still staying top of mind. So we don't want to take that one case example and then flip it on the opposite yeah. right? of 90% towards conversion. We have to find the right balance, but uh, it's a really fantastic question and something that we have to continue to explore. It is. And I honestly, like as somebody who's worn the hat on the upper funnel, um, high brand awareness stuff and to the tactical lower, like accountable media, I think you, you need both. And it's like the, the, every day we try to figure out what that balance is. So that's really, that's a great question. Um, another great one we have is how are we balancing the need to engage the masses while also leveraging data for more precision targeting? That's exactly the same question almost. Yeah. But it's, <laughs> it's like, I'm going to answer this one differently. <laughs> You're off the hook because I think you did a great job. Um, this is a good one. Do you have a loyalty program? If so, how does it align with your brand values? And how does your brand secure an edge in such a competitive industry? I think hmm. you that pretty well too. A really good question and something that I'm actively uh, working on. We have loyalty programs in a couple different markets, um, obviously not the US. Um, and having worked in loyalty for over a decade of my career, okay. um, uh, the challenge is in both, you know, with Starbucks rewards and the, you know, unpaid space and, and prime in the subscription based space. The problem with loyalty and QSR is that it's not very distinctive and not very diversified. It's largely the same earn and burn um, wherever you go. Um, and so I think, you know, to the latter part of the question, like it's really hard to stand out right now. And so unless you're, in my opinion is that unless we're going to do it in a distinctive way um, and stand out, then there's yeah. no point in doing it. Um, but then again, on the flip side, it's almost table stakes um, these days. So um, that's something that we're actively exploring um, and uh, and looking into and testing. And um, I don't know, who knows, hopefully you'll see something really great come out of all of this work that we're putting into it now. Yeah, I love that. I think it's a great question. Um, we've got a few more here. What technologies power what technology power and inform market your marketing and advertising? What what do you rely on? What technologies and what piece is still missing from the puzzle? So we have um, great question. We have um, we've been 
spending a lot of time and effort to try and get our MarTech um, capabilities um, and have commonality across our different markets. Um, you know, we have um, a really great um, CRM uh, partner and relationship um, in Braze. Uh, we've rolled them out to 12 additional countries over the past um, six months, I think, like really quickly. Um, and so we have um, a really great um, CDP relationship um, with Imparticle that we're rolling out. We have deep linking capabilities. Um, uh, we have, um, we're, we're looking on some, working with some partners on data lakes. Okay. Uh, we have an e-commerce uh, backend platform um, and web and app solution. Um, so I think, you know, what's missing right now um, is uh, from an offer wallet standpoint. So as we kind of go into like loyalty, um, mm -hmm. how do we try to test um, really easily kind of test different like offers and rewards? Um, and how does that, how do we evolve that as our uh, data capabilities mature? Um, location services technology, particularly ones that are um, scalable globally, um, is something that's um, that we're still exploring. Um, and then just kind of overall loyalty product as we go through the work that I mentioned earlier of defining yeah. what it is we need to do, then we need to look at um, how do we build or buy that solution um, and launch it in the future. That's excellent. Okay, that's great. And then I think I have time for one final one. How are you leaning into the consumer experience and leveraging their generated content? Um, I think that really varies by market. So one of the benefits of us being so decentralized, as I mentioned earlier, is that each market can bring the brand to life in a culturally relevant way that yeah. makes yeah, yeah, absolutely. And so while while our we have our iconic brand assets in the bucket and the red and white stripes and the kernel and finger looking good, that's the same everywhere. Um, uh, we have markets that can we have uh, we had a really great campaign, a TikTok campaign in Germany that garnered 1.8 billion views oh uh, through user generated content. And so we just kind of have these pockets of really great uh, fan bases. Some in, like in Australia are more sports oriented. Um, in South Africa, we really have great music relationships with um, with different artists. And so the brand really kind of comes to life culturally different in different um, areas and um, of the world world. And we see that through all of the great content that our users are generating. That's so great. And you, you tap into what works for that market in particular. Yeah. I love that. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. This has been such a great chat, Ashley. I've learned so much about your business. That was great. I love what Ashley mentioned that they are focused on access everywhere and ev everywhere in every way. I think that's a great mantra for likely many businesses and brands moving forward is that is what consumers expect now. But to also only do things um, when they can really stand out, really important in the QSR world. Really great discussion. I hope everyone enjoyed it. <clears throat> Next up, it brings me to our final session of the day. Um, this one is with Katrina Borschuk, Marketing Director of Snack Futures Innovation at Mondelez International, who will be speaking with Delini Fernando, VP of Marketing at Friosk. And they're just gonna be joining us in a moment. There we go. Hello. Hi. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Good. Wonderful. Um, thanks so much for joining us, you guys. Um, Welcome, uh, Katrina and Delaney, and thanks for closing out our live cast today. We look forward to the discussion. I'll let you guys take it away. Fantastic. Thanks so much. And Katrina, great to see you again. Good to see you too. I'm trying to figure out how to do the background thing here. Hang on. <laughs> I'm so good at Zoom. Uh, I know after like a year, I feel like I should have everything figured out. It's still... Still new. So thanks for everyone on our brand innovators community for joining us as we're going to be closing out and continuing the conversation around consumer engagement today. And more specifically, Katrina and I will be talking about the role of consumer engagement in building brands. I think for those who know Katrina and I personally, we share what I would call like a healthy obsession with consumer engagement, right, Katrina? It's, um, I'd like to think so, yeah. <laughs> something we're very, very passionate about on a personal level. But 
you know, we also represent companies who are deeply committed to engaging consumers in a way that not only exceeds consumer expectation, but really drives the business. And so a little bit of level setting for those who are joining us today, yeah. and you're not familiar with Freeosk, I'm proud that we are the only omni-channel discovery platform that is about curating memorable and importantly, measurable brand engagements across a variety of physical and digital touch points. And so the core of our consumer engagement really starts with our automated sampling kiosk. And we have over 1400 kiosks nationwide. You may have seen that at your local Sam's Club, Walmart, Albertsons, and a few other retailers coming on board. And from there, we're able to really surround the shopper with digital products that enable our brand partners to have continue dialogue with those interested consumers. And so for me, that's the most exciting part about consumer engagement is taking those real world intent signals, translating that first moment of consumer engagement into actionable insights. Now on the Mondelez side, I think brands that need no introduction and certainly are always reinventing the definition of brand engagement. But Katrina, folks are probably not as familiar with some of the new innovative work that's coming out, particularly in Snack Futures. So let's start there. Can you tell us a little bit about Snack Futures? What is it? How long has it been around? And how does something so innovative find itself in such a, a large multinational company? Absolutely. Can you hear me okay? Just sound check before I start. Yeah. Great. Okay. So um, many of you probably know Mondelez International. If you don't know Mondelez International, you definitely know some of our bigger brands around the world like Oreo Ritz, Cadbury, Milka, Trident Gum, some beloved snacking brands for consumers. And um, at Mondelez International, our purpose in to, is to empower people to snack right. And that's about providing the right snack made the right way for the right moments. And obviously all of our brands are continually looking to evolve and engage with consumers and um, grow with consumers and meet consumers changing needs. Snack Futures, which is where I work in Mondelez, is our innovation and venture hub that was founded in late 2018. And what our mandate is really to kind of help define the future of snacking and figure out how we can meet consumers where they're going and co-create the future of snacking really when it comes to especially well-being and sustainability. So we do that in three key ways. So we have sort of three pillars within Snack Futures. Invent, so invent, innovate, create our own brands. Um, venture, literally make venture investments in startups. So some of those um, that we've made are Uplift Foods, um, Hue. So Hue ultimately resulted in a, a full-on acquisition, but it started with a venture investment by our Snack Futures team and then Tor Food Tech out of Israel. So those are three of the venture investments we've made. And then the third pillar is Amplify. And that's something that's new to us this year where we're looking to amplify the impact of Snack Futures by partnering with startups and helping coach and mentor them. And, and it's a little bit of a sort of incubator model um, where we're working with nine um, startups new to, new to our program this year. So that's kind of how we're doing this, what we're doing. And so some of the brands that we've invented, and that's where I work, I work in the invent pillar, um, are we've invented five brands in the US and Europe, um, including Dirt Kitchen Snacks, which is what I'm gonna talk a bit about today because that's what I'm leading, Kapow, Milligram, Nokoe, and Ruckus & Co. And these are brands that we're literally, we are entrepreneurs. We're, we're creating startups from within Mondelez, leveraging internal and external ecosystems to um, invent the brands, co-create them with consumers, validate them, and then begin to incubate and grow them, hopefully to a point where we can scale them and then um, kind of make them part of the, the bigger Mondelez, the mothership, as I call it. Yeah. And so having that innovation arm internally, I imagine allows you to take a different fresh approach, maybe non-conventional ways to engage consumers and build brands. So what does that look like or what has it looked like for you moving from insight to actually bringing that product to market? Yeah. So I'm, like I said, I'm going to talk a lot about Dirt Kitchen because um, it's a little, it's an interesting case study. And so one that I've been leading, so I know the most intimately, but um, we started um, Dirt Kitchen with uh, a need, a consumer need that we were looking to fulfill. Um, we started with what we call demand spaces. I'm sure everyone from a big CPG has some kind of structure or the way they organize the world and how they look at white space, but ours are called demand spaces. And we started with an adult afternoon reset occasion, which has 
both functional and emotional needs for consumers. So you're looking for a bit of an energy boost to kind of get you through the rest of the day, bridge between lunch and dinner. Maybe it's a break from work or from errands or from childcare or whatever's happening in the afternoon. Um, so there's a lot of functional need, but there's also emotional needs. And you're looking for, you know, either satisfy a craving or a hit of crunch or um, something to uplift your mood. And we wanted to satisfy these needs, particularly for health-oriented consumers. And so when we sort of clashed together this, this health-oriented consumer and this need, it took us to a savory space and to specifically vegetables. So we had this insight that people want to get more vegetables in their lives. And so we thought, can we bring vegetables into snacking? So then we went to kind of go co-create this idea with consumers. So we started with a little bit more what I would call more traditional qualitative bundle building co-creation labs with consumers. Um, and we progressed from there into a few phases of what we call transactional learning test and learn. It's, it's learning by selling real food to, or real things to real people. Um, so rather than spending like three years to develop something in a traditional innovation way with stage gates and all this, we literally tried to get a minimally lovable proposition. It's a minimally viable proposition, but a little slightly higher bar because it's food and it's intimate. And we, we really want to sort of raise the bar. We want consumers to love the food that we're creating. Um, so, you know, work to get a minimally lovable proposition and then start selling it and but start selling it with hypotheses and questions and and do experiments to try to answer those questions. And so we did that through several phases. Um, so I would say in the in the early bundle building qualitative, we did a bunch of groups in New York and Denver. Um, so we started in New York, we started with a bunch of stimulus and a bunch of ideas and sort of narrowed down as we went. We validated and refined the insight throughout that and that insight of, yes, people are trying to get more vegetables into their lives, but really, really crystallized into was, yes, I'm trying to get more vegetables into my life because they're a great way to help meet my health goals. But like they weren't even thinking about veggies when it came to snacking because mm -hmm. veggies just weren't exciting enough or interesting enough to be a snack. So that insight became, you know, vegetables are a great way to meet my health goals, but they're not tasty or convenient enough to be a snack. So that kind of became our North Star of how do we actually make a snack that makes real vegetables into an exciting snack. That insight got crystallized within the first couple co-creation groups with consumers. And so we just kept building on it from there. And we came out of those labs with a bundle that we felt was a minimally lovable proposition. We had a little bit more work we had to do on it, a little more um, iteration before we could start selling, but we, we did that iteration, we made a batch, and then we decided to go online and into e-commerce and try to validate the bundle. We ended up on Amazon instead of D2C. We wanted to do D2C, but for a variety of technical reasons, it was just quicker to go to Amazon. Um, and our purpose was to kind of validate that insight, validate that we could find consumers online who were motivated by our messaging and send them to Amazon and get them to buy our product. So we had a series of sort of hypotheses set up and, and checked. So that became our concept test. We didn't do bases. We didn't do any sort of traditional concept testing. Our concept test was click-through rates on our digital advertising in Facebook and Instagram. And so, Proof of concept, that was our purpose on Amazon. Because the data isn't quite as rich on Amazon as it would have been on a D2C site, and we knew we wouldn't be able to sort of have those more intimate conversations with consumers, we also went to a farmer's market. And so this was like my dream as a big company marketer to actually like sell food at a farmer's market. You know, we've been talking to startups for years and asking them about their story and how did they get started. And so many were like, well, I had this problem I was trying to solve for myself. So I made this food and then I fed it to some of my friends and they thought it was great and they thought I should start selling it. So I made some and then I went to the farmer's market and like literally almost every startup we talked to back, you know, five plus years ago, it's like we went to the farmer's market and we sold our food and we talked to consumers and asked them how they liked it and how did it fit into their lives. And I was like, I want to do this. Why can't I do this? So we did that um, and the purpose there was to sort of get those rich qualitative insights from consumers about how could this fit into your life. Um, we, we got good feedback from those two things and I'll talk some more about the learnings later, but the next phase became, okay, great. 
We did pretty well on e-com. We did pretty well at a farmer's market. Is this bundle shelf ready? Can, will it move off the shelf in a brick and mortar environment? So that became sort of the next phase of transactional learning was, and, and we had a second product line that had been developed in parallel by one of my colleagues. So we also were like, can we put these two product lines together um, into one brand? And is it shelf ready? So we moved into brick and mortar in a small test market in Los Angeles. And we had four weeks of good data and then COVID shut the world down. So mm -hmm. We pivoted again to D2C this time, we were able to get that up and running and kind of at that point had, we felt good about the velocities that we had seen in those four weeks. We felt good about the retailer acceptance and then it became sort of refining the bundle. So again, we're, we're this whole time we're selling, um, refining the bundle, getting the pricing right, getting the mix right um, and able to, in order to enable us to sort of pull together what we felt was a, a legit brand to go then into incubation and start growing the brand. Um, so that's like how we did things, definitely different than how I've innovated in the past um, in, in the big company world, because literally we were, you know, always engaging with consumers and learning process, but literally like real world engaging with consumers, buying advertising, sending them to our website, getting them to buy, figuring out why they're not buying if they're not buying. And it's really been this whole process of engaging with consumers in order to learn and build the brand from day one. Yeah. I think there are probably those of us who have been on innovation. And when you said, didn't use Basies, it's like, ah, that must've been terrifying. Or, you know, hearing Amazon and farmer's market in the same sentence and building a brand, it's a very untraditional and unconventional way to go about it. So when you think about listening to consumers, I love this idea of engaging, really meeting a need, meeting retailer needs, um, but then also being able to adapt as you go along. So holding what's true and what ends up being right for the consumer, but then being able to evolve everything around it. How did you find that balance and how were you able to really synthesize those insights in real time? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> this is where I sound like a really big nerd because it literally was like scientific method. I mean, we with, with our learning partner, so Spark Starter Studio was the learning partner that we worked with, Deb Vicarelli um, was, like I think we spent hours on the phone together every week um, because literally we approached every week with, okay, what are the hypotheses that we're trying to validate this week? What are we trying to learn this week? What are the experiments that we're doing in order to validate or invalidate those hypotheses? We would run the experiments. We would look at the data. We would say, okay, what have we learned? Did we validate our hypothesis? Okay, cool. Let's move on to the next one. Did we invalidate it? Okay, why? Let's peel back the onion. Um, and it's been interesting as we've taken a step back and reflected on it today, because you actually learn more when you invalidate your hypotheses than when you validate them because of that confirmation bias, right? So you're like, okay, yeah, I thought this, we validated it, we were right, okay, let's move on versus, oh, we weren't right. Why weren't we right? What do we think is happening? What are, you know, what, what could be creating this? And then creating more experiments to try to figure out if that why is correct or pivoting and doing something totally different. So it's really been an interesting and uh, quite scientific process of sort of iterating and going through these learning. I mean, we were doing things like um, A-B testing of, of literally parallel websites. We have an A and a B version. We're buying the advertising on Facebook. We're sending people to randomly 50% to the A, 50% to the B with two different price points and doing weeks and weeks of that to build pricing curves to try to figure out where we should price the bundle, things like that. So um, it's been a, an interesting mix of quantitative data and also mm -hmm. intuition really to be able to make the decisions and move forward on a weekly basis. And the other key thing was like having the right people in the room to be like looking at the data, talking about what we felt we needed to do next. Can it be done? Yes, it can be done. Okay, let's go do it. If it can't be done, why not? And what can be done? So it was like the all hands on deck sort of agile, little a agile, not big a agile, but you know, more agile approach of just being able to iterate that bundle. Um, whether it was making product or packaging changes or price back architecture changes, or even, you know, the easier things to do our marketing messaging and imagery and stuff like that. Um, did that answer your question? It sure did. I mean, you had me at scientific methodology, so. <laughs> right <there with> you. <laughs> we love uh, well, hypotheses. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, let's talk about the brand. So talk yeah. about what are the flavors? What can consumers expect, you know, for those yeah, of us yeah. who haven't had a chance to have it yet? 
Yeah, absolutely. I was actually thinking as I was rambling that I should have done that at the beginning. Oh, so thank well, you for prompting me. Um, funny you say that. Oh, yay! Uh, I have to buy them online. So I have all six flavors. So I'm also going to ask you the annoying question of what's your favorite flavor? Oh, that's not annoying at all. But, but talk uh, to us about there's six, there's six flavors. Is that right? Yes, there are actually. Thank you for doing that because I can't seem to keep any in the house around here because they get eaten. Um, so Dirt Kitchen Snacks, we have two lineups. We've got air-dried veggie crisps. So Dylan, if you want to hold up a big bag, um, air-dried veggie crisps are simply seasoned. They're actually made from rescued veggies. So upcycling um, veggies that would have gone to waste. Um, so a nice sustainability story there, helping to reduce food waste. Um, but they are air dried veggies. They're crispy, crunchy, um, kind of a fun texture to, to munch on. These are all simply seasoned with extra virgin olive oil, sea salt. There's a little bit of black pepper on the zucchini, um, but it's zucchini. Blushed bell peppers. Blushed bell peppers are peppers that are halfway ripe between green and red. Fun fact of the day about vegetables, red peppers and green peppers are the same pepper. The red ones are riper. And when they're halfway ripe, stores don't want to buy them because stores only buy sell green peppers and red peppers. They don't sell blushed peppers. So we buy the blushed peppers and we make them into blushed bell pepper crisps. So if you open up that bag, you have a mix of green and red and something in between in there. My mind um, was just blown. I've always wondered that. Right? Fun fact about veggies of the day. And then the grape tomatoes, the third one is grape tomatoes. And so grape tomatoes and zucchini, if any of you live in the Northeast, you know that around this time of year, your gardens start going a little bit crazy with bell, with um, zucchinis and grape tomatoes. So those tend to be surplus where just the farms have too many and they can't be sold. Um, and so we buy them and, and air dry them and make them into crisps before they can go to rot on the farm. So that's the story about the crisps. And then the air dried veggies and nuts are, um, it's funny, this is the one where the positioning evolved a little bit. So the original thought on the air dried veggies and nuts was like interesting combinations of veggies and nuts. And when you put them together, it's this really fun snack. And the interesting combinations thing kind of went away over time. That wasn't as motivating. It literally, and our tagline is snackably delicious veggies. They are real recognizable veggies made into delicious, crispy, crunchy snacks. Um, so the air dried veggies and nuts have a little bit more of a culinary inspiration. They were actually inspired by um, when you cook in the kitchen with vegetables, oftentimes you don't have to do a whole lot to them, but a lot of veggie dishes and side dishes that are really interesting have veggies and nuts in them. Mm -hmm. So the green beans and almonds, if you want to hold up that one, that was the original product that we came up with when we were doing our bundle building labs. And that was inspired by green bean almondine, which is an Italian American side dish that my family cooks at every holiday. Um, in real life, it's green beans, almonds, maybe a little bit of shallots, butter, garlic, slivered almonds, and a squeeze of lemon. So we sort of made that into a snack. One of the things we learned early on with that one too, as we presented the brand to the world was that consumers were actually looking for it to be vegan. Everything else in the, in the brand was vegan. That one was not because there was butter in the seasoning. But as we were talking about plant-based snacking, one of the early learnings was like, okay, if you're talking about plant-based snackings, like you kind of got to be vegan. So we reformulated that one. So there's no butter in it anymore. Um, it is now kind of a garlic and onion and sea salt seasoning. And then the other two are inspired by, um, so the, they're zucchini chickpea pistachios with sea salt and black pepper. That's more of a sort of Mediterranean uh, inspiration. And the third one is carrot zucchini peanut with spicy chili lime. And that was inspired by sort of Thai noodle salads and the spice that comes with that. So that's the brand. Um, so veggies and nuts, okay, I guess. Uh, you know, we're, yeah, go ahead, go ahead and crunch. <laughs> so okay. it up. Um, you know, we, we sort of, the veggies and nuts are, think about it like a trail mix with dried veggies instead of dried fruit, definitely a savory experience. Um, and then the crisps are, are really more simply seasoned. They're all actually reasonably filling. The other fun fact about um, air dried veggies is as you eat them and you drink water, they little rehydrate a little bit in your stomach as you're eating. So they're actually quite filling as well. Um, and we love them. My favorite, honestly, it changes by the week. I go through phases with them. Um, I'm currently on a blushed bell pepper kick on the crisp side of things. And on the veggies and nuts side of things, I do not have a favorite child. 
I really don't like, I love all of them and I, I go through phases with them. And sometimes I'm like thinking one of them's not my favorite. So I take a break from it and then I eat it again a couple weeks later and I'm like, this is so good. Yeah. So I really do. Uh, I love them all. It's, it's hard not to fall in love with all of these. They look amazing. So far what I've tasted is amazing. Um, and so I would be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about sampling, being a sampling company for Yosk and, and you're, you're getting to see me taste it and experience it right now. So tell me a little bit about what that looked like when you were getting real world feedback on, on the, uh, on the flavors and the inspiration and, and maybe the role of sampling in that as well for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with um, one of the things we learned really early on when we were on Amazon was like lowering the barrier to trial for this brand is really, really important. Um, our initial, um, our initial click through and our motivation was really strong, but we were falling way below our conversion target originally. And the hypotheses behind that were taste skepticism and price too high. So what we actually ended up doing was quickly pivoting. I mean, my, my core packaging team was like, not super happy with me at the time. I think they still have a little bit of PTSD from this one, but I'm like, can we, can we make a variety pack? And they're like, well, you said we weren't going to make a variety pack. And I'm like, I changed my mind. We need a variety pack. We need to like make it really easy for people to try this. So we went from like 12 count straight packs to a six count variety pack with all three flavors and lowered the price to, I believe it was $14.99 at the time on Amazon, literally just trying to get it as like inexpensive, but still reasonable and not completely unprofitable as possible for people to try the brand that helped a ton. So that sort of helped validate those hypotheses. Okay, yeah, taste skepticism. People just don't think veggie snacks are gonna taste good because mm. most of them don't. Um, and price being like, I don't wanna spend 25 or $26 on something if I don't know if I'm gonna like it. And we had like a money back guarantee and all that stuff, but still like psychologically, you just, you want it to be easy. So that we knew, okay, we gotta make it easy for people to try it. When we went to the farmer's market, we, we were sampling and selling, but like, that's where we've really started to learn that like people legit didn't think this was going to taste good. And then they would taste it at the farmer's market and be like, oh my God, I've never tasted veggies like this before. Like, oh, it tastes so much better than I thought it was going to. Oh, that crunch is so great. So we started kind of understanding and we were track tracking our conversion at the farmer's market of like, of the people who tried how many bought and it was really strong. So we're like, okay, sampling has to be a big part of this effort. So when we went into brick and mortar pre-COVID, that was a huge piece. We had brand teams in those stores and it was a small number of stores again, like test and learn, old school market test, 15, 20 stores. But we had multiple sampling events going on, trying to get people to try the brand and then tracking our conversion and making sure that like people were liking it. Um, and it was definitely helping and moving the needle, but then for obvious reasons, sampling stopped for a really long time we're just starting to get back to like in-store sampling now. Um, foot traffic is starting to come back. We're in LA only, by the way. I know I saw a question come in on the chat. So from a brick and mortar perspective right now, we're only in the Los Angeles area and we're selling D 2 C on our website for now. We're working on growing distribution, um, but sampling starting to come back in. The foot traffic is still not as strong. A lot of people are buying online as we all know as consumers um, and you know, with, COVID still on people's minds, like people just aren't as excited about eating something while they're out shopping. So we are trying to figure out other ways to get smartly get samples in the right consumer's hands. We're doing some partnerships, trying to partner with some fitness studios and things like that in places where we think that our consumer target is congregating. Um, but yeah, really, really key, especially for something that's a new-ish category and a category that people maybe haven't had as positive experiences with in the past. Yeah, no, that's very much aligns with what we've learned from insights as well is reducing that barrier and any risk aversion, whether it's a new product or a new brand or just new category altogether um, is really is really critical. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your background, Katrina, and, and just you've had a, a breadth of experiences. So how do you see that as preparing you for this current role in innovation? Oh. Okay. How far back do you want to go? Um, I'll do the quick <laughs> well, one. So we, I, can, I can summarize the first part because I know you're sort of ex-banker turned marketer. And I think yeah. for those of us who have had those early introductions to like marketing psychology courses, those are always the gateway in. And you realize how much fun understanding how consumers think and feel and act um, is really the sort of the, the start of long marketing careers. So what's been that yeah. sort of those pivot points for you and, and what do you end up kind of referring back to in your, your previous careers to help you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think 
one of the pit so I came from business school to what was Kraft Foods at the time. Now Mondelez, obviously the company has changed significantly since I started 15 years ago. I mean, I, it still blows my mind that it was 15 years that I've been here um, because it does feel so different than it did back then. But I would say the first real pivotal moment for me was I was working on Planters Nutrition, which was at the time the sort of health and wellness oriented subline of Planters. And it was like nut mixes, nut, nuts and trail mixes specifically designed to deliver health benefits to consumers. And it was working on that brand that I realized that sort of my North Star as a marketer is to help consumers live healthier lives. And that's very much in line with my personal values. I've been an athlete my whole life. I've always been into healthy eating. I'm always trying to help my friends and family be healthier. So I was like, oh, I can do this for a living. I can actually help strangers be healthier too. Um, so that I would say was a big pivot point for me. Um, and then with the split up from Kraft, Old Kraft becoming Mondelez and Kraft Foods, um, I really wanted to be on the global side of the business. So I was able to kind of make my way back to biscuits and stay with Mondelez at the time. I moved into the global organization eight years ago, and that's been fascinating and amazing for me as well. Just having a passion for consumers and consumer engagement and, and understanding consumers and understanding humans, the opportunity to do that in other markets besides the U.S. Mm -hmm. has been phenomenal learning experience and a total blast as well. Like I, I joke around that like one of my core skills as a human is that I can navigate a grocery store in like any country in any language because we've had so many opportunities to like go to other markets and learn about consumers there and learn about their, how they shop and where they shop. And um, that's been a big pivotal thing as well. And then, you know, landing myself back in global innovation, being able to focus on well-being specifically officially. I've tried to sort of path a, a chart through a course through well-being stuff within the company personally for my career, but actually landing officially in a job that my job is to do well-being. It's it's been a dream. So um, fun and also scary being an entrepreneur. You know, I've 13 years of big company, um, 12, 13 years of big company. Now all of a sudden I'm trying to grow a startup from within the company. It's totally different in some ways, but also able to obviously use a lot of the same learnings and structures from the first 13 years to do that. Um, but yeah. Yeah, it's been that's fun. great. And for those who are uh, you know, joining us today, feel free to start chiming in on any questions as we're getting towards the end of our chat together. Uh, we'll be sure to pepper those in. But um, Katrina, you just mentioned you know, being an entrepreneur, and, and starting some, a new business and a business unit within a big company. Talk a little bit about what the big tried and true trusted brands have learned from Snack Futures and what are the parts of big business that you were able to use as you were innovating new brands? Yeah, I mean, we're, we've been doing this transactional learning test and learn thing for almost three years now. Um, it's definitely something that the bigger brands are thinking about and trying to do. So we've been having a lot of conversations with them and just sort of helping them understand how we've approached it, what we've learned, how we've done things. Um, you know, some of the, some of the stuff we're doing is very similar to what they're doing just on a much smaller and much more targeted scale. So, you know, we learn from them as much as they learn from us. Um, I think also having the ventures team within the U S our North America business unit. So the part of the business unit that has Tate's and perfect snacks and Hugh, um, you know, they, they were us anywhere from 10, 15, 20 years ago, you know, they all started as actual startups and, and grew their way up the curve. And now they've moved into the big company and they're sort of straddling a little bit. So we've been able to learn from them and from the mothership as much as I'd say the mothership has been able to learn from how we're operating um, and how we're approaching things. I think the biggest one is, you know, when they think about doing a test and learn, I'm always encouraging people to going back to that nerd thing again, like be really specific about what you're trying to learn. Um, I think the, the, bias can be towards, oh, let's do a test and learn. Let's do a test market and we're going to launch something. And then if it succeeds, we'll launch it bigger. I'm like, that's not how we're doing it. Like that's a, that's a pass fail sort of situation. We're doing it more of a like continuous learning. Um, 
again, like being real, what are your questions? What are your hypotheses? What are you learning on a weekly basis? Are you proving or disproving those hypotheses? Iterate, actually take what you're learning and use it to iterate your bundle. If you're not going to do that, then just do a launch. Don't, don't try to do a test and learn. So I would say that's, that's the message that we've been trying to get across and sort of help people understand how we're doing that. Yeah. I'm going to take a couple questions that were submitted to us. So one is, did you notice a spike in sales of your healthy brands during the pandemic? And if so, do you see that trend continuing post pandemic? Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I mean, I'm thinking back to like the early days of the pandemic and everybody, we were all trying to just get whatever food we could, right? Grocery stores were like lines out the door, nothing was on the shelf. And I would say really early on, it was like, oh, people are stockpiling Oreos and Ritz and they're not worried about health. And I'm sitting here going, what do you mean they're not worried about health? This is a <laughs> health pandemic. Like this is, this is the global health crisis. People are going to be worried about health. They might not be worried about health yet, but they are going to be worried about health really soon. So we were like definitely beating the well-being drum pretty early on when like the more indulgent things were spiking. Mm -hmm. But then, yeah, absolutely. Over time, we've seen a shift in consumers towards globally towards health and well-being, whether it's because they're like, okay, well now immunity is super important and I need to stay healthy or it's because we've all been hunkered down for however long and and not getting out enough and eating too much and now people have got weight they want to lose like there's every in every reason in between i think yes absolutely um i think with all things like the pendulum may be swung all the way one way and it's going to swing a little bit back the other way but i do think there's been a fundamental shift in consumers in their approach towards eating you know people who were always out at restaurants and then had to cook at home for a year like Hopefully that got people kind of used to cooking at home that weren't cooking at home, things like that. So I do think there've been like material changes in behavior as humans and how we eat and how we approach food and how we engage with how we get that food, um, whether it's shopping in e-commerce or whatever. Yeah, I, I do think some of these trends are here to stay. Yeah, it has been really fascinating. I know there's a lot of McKinsey reports out there about 75% of shoppers have changed their behavior and, and plant in keep some of those behavioral changes or whether it's yep. looking at categories that that shifted over this time. Um, and yes, my, I feel like my pantry looked one half was completely indulgent and the other half was healthy. And, and that was sort of how, how you met balance during the pandemic. Um, another question we have for you is what are the biggest challenges for this next phase of growth? And what are the social media strategies that are going to help you tackle those challenges? Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, so for, for dirt kitchen specifically, I would say our current challenge is how do we grow awareness of this tiny little brand, specifically in the Los Angeles area where we got brick and mortar distribution and be able to grow velocities. So again, kind of getting people over that hurdle of, of taste skepticism and cost and high cost. And unfortunately, dried veggies are not cheap. Like. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're not cheap and therefore the product's not cheap. So we've got to figure out how we can use our marketing to get people intrigued in the brand, by the brand and get them through the funnel to purchase and then hopefully like it enough that they'll purchase again. Um, so I would say that's really our challenge for, for the foreseeable future is like growing awareness and trial, um, you know, hopefully getting some of that repeat. And if we're not getting the repeat, figuring out why and, and making changes accordingly. Um, and then as we look to grow beyond the LA area, doing the same, you know, it, the, the good thing about being in one market is, um, you know, you can geo-target all your social, you know, digital advertising, of course, it's just way cheaper to geo-target. It's not cheaper per million, but it's cheaper overall to mm -hmm. focus on one market than the whole country. That said, we've also got the D2C business that's obviously anywhere in the US that you can buy. So it's really balancing those two priorities, um, but with a specific focus right now on growing velocity so that we can not only maintain, but grow our shelf space. Did anything surprise you as you were digging into those insights and then uncovering who your shopper was? So I think there is a human truth that makes sense, right? That it's, it's hard to wrap your head around veggies that are tasty, but as you got to know your shopper and your key consumer and that person that you're trying to target in social, did anything surprise you about who they were and, and who your biggest opportunity was with? I would say early on, it wasn't that surprising. Like who we thought would be motivated by our message was motivated by our message. 
I would say now that we're growing and we're starting to um, see different people than that come in and different usage occasions come in, we're literally in the process of doing this now. Like I'm in the process of recruiting some first time buyers, some repeat buyers and some card abandoners from the D2C site and doing one-on-one -on -one interviews to try to figure out what's happening. But we have some hypotheses, of course, on what's happening and what some of those surprises might be. Um, on the crisp side of things, the zucchini crisps are definitely the hot item. Like when I was out in LA a couple weeks ago um, visiting stores and that is definitely the one with the strongest velocity. So our hypothesis is our people are turning to zucchini crisps instead of potato chips for that mm. like crunch, afternoon crunch craving. And if that's the case, like we might take that in a more chip-like direction. I don't know. So that one, you know, a little bit of surprise to me. It's a slightly different insight. We're gonna try to understand dig a little deeper, peel back the onion and figure out, all right, why are we trying to get more veggies in our lives? Is it really just about overall health or is it about something else? And if so, um, what might we do with that information? So yeah. more to come there. Always surprises. Yeah. And that comment you made about the zucchini chips being a substitute for, for chips is a great segue into a question we have around brand shift. So while all successful brand shifts and change over time, what do you think is going to be foundational for dirt kick for the dirt kitchen brands? Um, That's a really good question. Yeah. Um, and we actually had an early decision that had to be made around that, whether it was going to be all about rescuing veggies, or is it really just going to be about making veggies delicious? And um, some learning and experiments we did led us in the making veggies snacking, or not even making, making veggies delicious. Sorry, I even said that wrong. We think veggies are delicious, making them snackable. So is it about rescuing and, and that sustainability story or is it just about making veggie snackable? We landed on the just making veggie snackable. Um, for now, the world is changing, we'll see. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, what does that mean? Is it literally just helping people who already wanna eat veggies, eat veggies or would it grow to be, you know, maybe there's some people that aren't that excited about veggies and can we make veggies even more exciting for them too? Maybe, I don't know, we'll see where consumers lead us. Well, I, I can't consumer, this consumer is going to lead it right to like go snack on my, <laughs> all my fun things over here. Um, Katrina, thank you so much. This was really awesome chatting with you and thanks for sharing all of your insights. Thank you. Uh, thank you guys so much. You know, this was great Katrina just to hear about the approaches that Mondelez is using to invent new products that empower people to snack right. I love that. Um, I actually knew a little bit about dirt kitchen snacks before um, this session today, but it was really interesting to learn the story about how the products were concepted created, how you're planning to promote them to consumers and kind of learn a little bit more about each of the varieties. I haven't tried them yet, but you know what? I'm going to Amazon or your site right now because those, uh, what was it? Blushed bell pepper crisps sound awesome. I got to get me some of those. So well, let me know what you think of them, please. Always say yes, I will I'll pass that along. It was, uh, this was a great session. Perfect one to close out our day. Um, talking about consumer engagement, really appreciate both of your time. Um, and, uh, have a great rest of your day. Thanks, you too. Thanks so much. Have a good one. Bye. Well, thank you everyone else for, um, for joining us, all the participants. Thank you very much for, for watching today. What an incredible day of programming and content from our speakers and moderators. I think one thing we heard from each marketer was that the more personalized you can make a consumer experience with your brand, the more likely they are to engage with you. And the way to do that is to really listen to your consumers and their needs and wants and deliver on those. Makes perfect sense. Thank you to all of our speakers and moderators for some great discussions today. We hope you all join us uh, tomorrow at 12 noon Eastern time for Brand Interviews Behind the Brand Summit. We will be joined by marketing leaders from PayPal, 1-800-Flowers.com, PepsiCo, and, morning, and many more. Thank you for joining everyone. We hope to see you again soon.